Hi. Okay. Now I'm doing one of these on video. It's rather disorienting, actually. Um, I spent the last several hours doing a walk down memory lane, uh, looking at my archives. But uh, I spend most of my time thinking about the future. As far as I'm concerned, just because I'm disgustingly old, it doesn't mean I am not interested in doing lots more things. And in fact, I feel like I'm kind of just getting started. I finally know how to do a bunch of things. And it's taken me 60 years to learn what I've learned. And now I want to start doing stuff. So I have spent my life doing pretty large projects. And these projects tend to sort of build over the course of time. And uh, I'm kind of interested in what can I do now, given what I've already built. And there's sort of a complicated trade-off between doing things which are uh, sort of maintaining what one's already built and making what one's already built realize its potential and doing new things that uh, maybe are in different directions or maybe build on what one's already built. And so I, I've um, uh, sort of a, 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 and I also sort of believe in spending, you know, uh, sort of not quite 100% of my time just doing things, but some little percentage of my time thinking about what things I should do, so to speak. So, you know, it's like 97% uh, doing, 3% planning. So I do tend to think about what, what might I do? And um, it's, uh, you know, there tend to be at any given time, there tend to be these things that are made possible by where I've reached in terms of the things I built, the things that I now know how to do, and the things that uh, the world has made possible by uh, ambient technology that exists or whatever else. And, and it's sort of there are things which I think about um, um, where uh, it's, um, I'll talk about some of the things that I have thought about for decades doing, and it's like, am I ready to do this yet? I mean, one of them for a long time was Wolfram Alpha, which back from, you know, I was showing earlier today some uh, few, few, uh, a few things from when I was like in elementary school and so on. Um, by the time I was like 12 years old, I was interested in things that were similar to what uh, is now Wolfram Alpha. And it was like, can I build this general system that will have all this knowledge and be able to compute answers to things and so on? And the answer at that time was, well, no. Um, then a few decades go by, and I think about it again, and I was sort of, at that point, um, uh, I'd had some reasons to say, oh, this is impossible, you know, you need to invent general AI to make this possible. Then I kind of realized from my work in sort of studying the computational universe of possible programs, I realized, well, no, actually, I don't think there really is a bright line between the intelligent and the merely computational. And by that point, I had a lot of really great computational tools that we built in what's now Wolfram Language. Um, and uh, so I thought, gosh, let me take these things that I thought about doing when I was like 12 years old and uh, see if I can actually do them for real. And that's how Wolfram Alpha sort of came to be, was going back to things that I thought about decades earlier, but where this sort of ambient technology hadn't existed. It's always a cautionary tale for somebody like me that, for example, folks like Leibniz in the 1600s had thought about doing something like Wolfram Alpha, but there would have been a big mistake for them to have spent their lives trying to trying to do something like that because you know the ambient technology just didn't exist. You know, like Isaac Newton figured out that you could have an artificial satellite around the Earth, but um, you know it's it's just as well well that uh, he didn't end up spending his life trying to you know build a um, uh, build a space company because it would have been way too early. And I think one can be lucky and unlucky in the time and history in which one lives. I mean, I, I consider myself to have been lucky in the sense that. Uh, the thing that seems to fit well with my kind of personal um, way of thinking, which is kind of this idea of computation, this has been the time in which that idea of computation has gone from being kind of just an idea to being something that you can really do things with. And um, it's, been, it's been pretty neat to be uh, part of sort of the, 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 the growth curve of this idea of computation. By the way, it has a lot longer to run, but um, it, it's, it's a slow growth curve, actually. I mean, there's some things like, you you know, for a lot of technologies, you see first there was none of it, and then within 20 years, there's saturation. The ideas of computation, I think, are kind of deep enough. They're sort of fundamental ideas that are kind of on the scale of the ideas that make civilization happen or not. 
Um, and I think that they will take a lot longer to fully ramp. And we've seen, you know, the ramp that's been going since probably, oh, I don't know how where you'd count it, the 1930s, 1940s, um, the ramp that we've been on, uh, we are, we're only part way through that ramp. I think a lot of the things that will happen from here on out have to do with kind of um, uh, sort of the relationship of the human condition with the computational universe and the fact that there's what is possible to be based on what can be done computationally and what we humans have evolved to be and choose to be and sort of the interplay between those things. And I think we're only seeing the very, very early stages of that interaction. And people were asking earlier about what do I think about, um, you know, when will sort of human consciousness be uploadable into digital form and so on, and, and that will happen. Um, and, uh, you know, then we have to ask what do things look like when that happens? And something I've thought about for quite a while is, is kind of when, you know, we've uploaded sort of a bunch of human consciousnesses into um, purely digital form, um, what um, uh, what will we then have? We will have this sort of box of a trillion souls. What will that box be like? We'll see this box and it'll have all these little processes going on inside it and we'll say, this is amazing. It's all of these human souls and they're thinking about all these things and they're imagining this amazing virtual world and all this kind of stuff. And then somebody from the outside would look at it and say, it's just a box and it's full of, you know, electrons and atoms and processes and physical processes going on. What's so special about it? And therein kind of lies a lot of, I think, the, the paradox of uh, both sort of the, the technological endpoint and the trajectory of science and its relationship to kind of human condition. Because I think that that's um, uh, a lot of what's going on there is thinking about. So, so what is special about that box is it encapsulates this very unique history that us humans have in detail had. But I don't think there's anything fundamentally special about that history. It's, you know, there's, it's no more fundamentally special than the history of, I don't know, the rocks in the earth or something. Um, but it's a history that is very much our human history, and it's a history that's important to us. But this question about sort of what's possible, what is computationally possible versus what we humans find interesting and choose to make part of our um, kind of um, uh, civilization, the um, uh, that that's um, 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 uh, that that's that that's that's what we that's what we're interested in. I see that there's a message here that says that there are all kinds of technical problems. So hopefully those are um, uh, those are going to get resolved. Um, I think this is maybe my um, uh, uh, modernity thing. I. I don't think there's a 4K monitor. No, I don't think so. Um, that is what we've been trying to build in Wolfram Language is this representation that goes from human thinking to what is computationally possible, that represents, that tries to cast things in computational form, uh, that lets us humans think about things in sort of concrete computational form in a way that can be uh, transmitted and understood by, by our computational systems. And so in terms of, you know, the what's next thing, well, you know, I just spent the last 32 years building Wolfram Language, um, and uh, the um, part of the what's next is keep doing that because we've gotten a long way. Um, there's further to go, but we've gotten a very long way. You know, the, the goal is to kind of represent everything in the world computationally. Um, we've got a fair distance with that. We're representing a lot of kinds of things, kinds of operations one can do, kinds of things people are interested in, you know, whether it's uh, people asking their intelligent assistants this or that and it going through the, um, the Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Language stack to answer those questions, whether it's people discovering all kinds of things at the frontiers of all sorts of, uh, you know, science and other areas. Um, we've captured a lot of things that are needed for, um, uh, to sort of represent ideas computationally. And kind of the thing that I've realized only actually in rather recent times, embarrassingly recent times, is kind of the historical analog here, which is what happened like 400 years ago with the creation of things like mathematical notation that had been kind of before that, people just used words to talk about math. And then they got this notation for representing math. And once you had the notation for representing math, you could really take math places and, you know, algebra got invented and then calculus and so on. And... What that caused was the, the creation of the kind of mathematical approach to science, which I don't think would have been possible 
without that kind of notational innovation. So with computation, we've been with Wolfram language and the whole sort of computational language idea, the whole idea has been in a sense, although I have to say I have not, I've only recently kind of really understood this arc of history. Um, the whole idea has been to make, uh, to provide a language, a computational language that can uh, represent computational thoughts in a, in, a, in a concrete way. And you know, what we've had with the, with the programming languages is something rather different. We've had something where it's like human tell computer what to do. Well, let's see. We were talking about kind of the, the world of um, uh, computational language and kind of the understanding of uh, what, what becomes possible once you have a way to express computational thoughts in a kind of concrete form. And I was mentioning that kind of the, the traditional programming languages are kind of uh, have been more in the just tell the computer what to do in terms the computer understands, whereas our goal in Wolfram language, which I've, as I say, now really realized more in its historical context, only in pretty recent times, is this kind of get a way to represent kind of computational thoughts in concrete form as a way to kind of take the things that we humans think about and bridge them to the things that are possible in this computational universe of, of, uh, of possible computation. So, well, that's, um, you know, that's a big thing that's just now becoming possible. I mean, we, we haven't had you know, this development of computational language. Uh, you know, the direction that I've gone with Wolf language is really very different from the direction that, that anybody has gone. It's kind of a crazy direction because it's kind of like put everything in it, design everything in a coherent way. That's something where you're signing up for spending half your life or more, um, you know, building that out. It's not something where you just say, oh, I'm going to make this language over a weekend and uh, I'm just going to put down some primitives and then, you know, there'll be a whole community that will build it up. It's, it's something where you have to kind of stay on it forever. And I've been doing it now, well, for 32 years plus a bit extra from when I did SMP and things like that. So it's probably about 40 years or so now. And we're, we're certainly not, we're by no means finished, but we are definitely, uh, um, it is, it is uh, um, uh, it's certainly the, the end of the beginning, so to speak. Um, we certainly are, are on a very, very good path. And kind of this idea now of encapsulating kind of computational intelligence in our language, providing a computational language that allows us to represent uh, how humans think, what humans want to, want to talk about, in computational form, you know, this is off and running. Now there are practical issues like how do we deploy this as ubiquitously as possible in the world? And uh, really that's in part a big pile of software engineering. And we're, you know, we're steadily getting better at that. I mean, you know, one of the goals in the near term is to take Wolfram language and um, be able to let it be deployed everywhere. We've kind of got now this Wolfram engine system and now the free Wolfram engine for developers just slot a Wolfram engine into anything to get the kind of features of this kind of computational intelligence and computational language in whether it's in a software system, a hardware system, whatever else. Um, I think that the, um, uh, that's, um, uh, you know, that'll be a, a, that's a big practical piece of build out. And I was mentioning at the beginning here, sort of the trade off between sort of uh, um, making the things one's already built realize their potential versus doing new things. And that's definitely, there's, there's more to do there on making what we've already built realize its potential. I think it's, it's, uh, it's still, uh, although widely used in the world, it's still a way underperformer relative to what kind of this computational language idea, um, relative to the actual importance that, that this, this idea has in kind of the history of intellectual development. Um, and, you know, it'll slowly get there. Um, I think it's one of, one of the other things that happens when you're as ancient as I am is that, you know, I've just seen an awful lot of things actually happen in the world. You know, I started my career pretty young, so that has given me a longer time base. You know, I was a sort of fully functional operative by the time I was like 20 or so, uh, you know, had my PhD and was a professor type and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, and even started my first company within a year of that time. 
Um, so I've, I've kind of seen now, I've sort of got a 40 year baseline now of sort of what happens in the world. And so there are some things where it's kind of people are saying, oh no, it's never going to work. It's, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, oh, come on, you know, I've seen this before. This is, you know, this is a pattern I've seen. It'll take a, it'll take some time. And, you know, it's, it's kind of shocking to me that there are things that we invented like 30 years ago, like the notebook concept, for example, which are finally like, oh, everybody's saying, oh, this is a great concept. I always thought it was kind of obvious, but, um, uh, it's it is a good concept, and um, you know, but it takes decades for people to realize these things sometimes. And I think sometimes there are. Um, uh, well, it was a little bit shocking to me as I was going through some of these documents earlier today to be finding things from 32 years ago or something, or even longer ago than that, where I'm saying like, oh yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea. We should think about implementing that now. So you know, this is a long term business. Um, and uh, but there are lots of things which are kind of inexorable in the way that they play out. For example, another one is my whole new kind of science, kind of exploring the computational universe thing. It is absolutely inexorable that that um, kind of approach to science and way of thinking about things um, will will steadily grow and be more and more important in kind of the global view of how things work. Um, and we've seen some pieces of that already happen. I mean, the transition from you know. 300 years of, if you want to make a new model of something, use mathematics to in the last decade or two, kind of uh, a transition to, oh, well, you should use a computational model, um, a program or something, if you want to make a model of things. And it's kind of a, so far, largely silent transition that's happened where it's like, uh, you might have said, and people did say, oh my gosh, th this is all, you know, nothing like this is going to work. Um, you know, it's all going to be mathematics. It's been that way for 300 years. How could it possibly change? Um, well, sometimes new ideas actually can change things. And I think that uh, what we're seeing with computation is a bunch of ideas that could have been had a lot earlier in human history, I think, um, but weren't. But once you have them, they're very clean, they're very clear, they're very simple at some level, um, and they're very powerful, and uh, they will be important defining aspects of the future. Well, so, you know, part of my... Uh, uh, part of my future is develop the Wolfram language more um, and uh, keep trying to, you know, steadily over the years, I've understood more and more ways in which one can think about the world computationally. And we've been sort of, I've been understanding more and more sort of frameworks for thinking about things computationally. And that's what we've been building in Wolfram language. And uh, having built to a certain level, it's possible to see further and do more. And uh, that's some. Um, uh, I certainly intend to do lots of that. I'm also interested in seeing how do we make the language more and more ubiquitous because, um, you know, I spend a long time working on this and I just like to see as many people as possible actually use it because it's kind of fun that way. Um, and, uh, and because realistically, if we do it correctly in the world, that helps to actually provide an ecosystem in which more and more and more can be built within the language. But it's a complicated thing because what I have learned is this is hard work, and it requires very sort of uh, very systematic um, uh, kind of um, effort to keep a project this big, this coherent for this long. And that's been largely my personal effort, now shared. I'm happy to say with uh, with lots of people, both at our company and to some extent outside. Um, and uh, I mean, certain people outside are, are understand what we're doing and are very. Uh, I think uh, uh, many people are very enthusiastic and, you know, on live streams like this, they, they make great suggestions and so on. But in the end, kind of, uh, as I'm reminded uh, with, with depressing frequency, you know, in the end, I kind of have to figure out and make the decisions. Um, and that's what's needed to, to maintain this as a coherent effort. And I think this is something where people sort of say, oh, just sort of throw it out to the world, you know, make, let everybody, you know, uh, just figure out what to do. Well, it, it won't work. Um, you know, we, we try small pieces of this and there's some particular kinds of things where that's a, a good idea, but the, you know, to have something <clears throat> where uh, we sort of maintain consistency and coherence over this period of time, it's kind of a has to be led type project. And I'd like to figure out, you know, with things like Free Wolf Management for Developers, we're kind of making the core of what we do free, the Wolfram Alpha system is, is free to use on the web. Uh, we're about to make notebook publishing completely free on, on, on the web and so on. 
um, and we've had our notebook player for 30 years for, for running notebooks and so on. And so, so these things, and, and you know, realistically, uh, basically in the US now, pretty much all you know, significant univer major universities have site licenses, so our stuff is sort of free to use there. Um, but in the end, there's kind of a, uh, you know, I haven't figured out a better way to do this than the very simple, you make stuff, it's valuable, uh, people pay for it, you use the money you make to make more stuff. Um, that's uh, that's the scheme I found, and and as I as I, I know many people who've been responsible for for other approaches to this, and they're like, no, no, our approach doesn't really work. It's you know it looks good, but it doesn't really work. You know, keep doing what you're doing. So so that's what I'm doing. But uh, I'd love to figure out some some brilliant refactoring of the kind of um, of how things work to to just uh, uh, I think I think by now our our technology is, is pretty widely accessible to people. Um, I think the challenge now is just that it has actual ideas in it, and those ideas need to have time to get absorbed, and that time is unfortunately measured in decades. Um, but, uh, you know, slowly pieces of it start to get better and better understood. Um, I think um, uh, the... Um, so... Um, uh, to to so as I say, one one big direction is kind of Wolfram language. Develop it further. I, I, as I say, the 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 you know this idea of computational language enables one to do lots of things computationally. I think this kind of whole field of computational X for all X uh, from sort of archaeology to zoology or whatever is is a big and important thing. I have to say that personally, I think I am most valuable in kind of the upstream part of that business, kind of working on the upstream tools for how one can enable computational X for all X, rather than working on many particular computational Xs, even though I personally would greatly enjoy working on lots of computational Xs. Um, but I, I think that the kind of the upstream version of it is probably the place where one has, for somebody with my particular skills, such as they are, has, has more leverage. I think that, um, you know, I've been thinking actually about, uh, you know, because I've certainly thought about lots of computational axes, and I kind of, sometimes I, I talk to people and it's like, haven't you realized that your field can be made computational in this and this and this way? And they say, oh, that's kind of interesting. I've sort of thought about uh, finding some way to communicate that, whether it's in a, a, a lots of blog posts, whether it's in live streams, whether it's in some other format, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm interested to figure that out, of, of kind of doing the okay world, you know, you want to know about computational X, I'll try and tell you what I've figured out, at least about computational X, the rest is up to other people. Um, the, uh, so, so that's a, another direction is kind of the computational X direction. There's a lot of things in education related to computational X. So for example, uh, you know, one of the things that's happening at universities right now, it's kind of funny to see for me is, is that now, you know, computation is the big thing. So everybody going to the fancy universities wants to study computer science. Um, that's actually a, a sort of uh, kind of um, uh, you know complicated for the people who run these universities because like they don't the university isn't fifty percent computer science professors and if you know seventy percent of your students want to study computer science there's a bit of a mismatch to what universities actually have and I I think it's a big shame when universities start closing down so sort of the traditional areas of learning because gosh that's not popular this year that's a mistake. I mean, in the in the long view of history, that's a that's a serious mistake, um, in my view. But uh, in any case, I mean the the so. Uh, but right now, you know, uh, sort of um, computation is the thing people say they want to study. We'll see, you know, if there's a if there's another economic downturn for the um, computer industry, then maybe that will change. But for now, that's 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 the way people people seem to be thinking. And I think that the um, uh, the way that um, uh, so then the question is, what do these people really want to study? Do they really want to study computer science or do they want to study computational X for some X, possibly an X, but they don't know what the X is yet? And I think the vast majority of these people actually want to study computational X, maybe even for a known value of X, so to speak. Um, but yet, the only thing that's sort of in the course catalog is computer science. And actually, a lot of the core courses of computer science are exactly the same as they were 30 or 40 years ago, you know. I don't know what, finite automata, compiler design, I don't know, things like this. So I, I guess there's been some stuff added about, you know, actual software development and so on. Um, 
but that's more for, I would say, software engineers than for the typical person who wants to be a user of computation. And by, you know, I'm, I'm a big enthusiast, actually, of the things that are core computer science, but I also don't have the belief that, you know, everybody in the world needs to learn these things. People need to learn computational thinking, but that's different from learning computer science. And, you know, the, the typical computer science curriculum, maybe they've added on robotics, machine learning, cryptography or something at the end, but it's been rather static for a rather long time. Um, and I think the thing that, um, uh, it's kind of charming, you know, you look at, uh, I don't know, when writing was new and the time of, you know, ancient Babylon or something. And, um, you know, there were these scribal schools where people were taught to write. And for a while, you know, they, they taught them to write. And then after a while, they had to teach them to write things to write about. I think in a lot of computer science education, we haven't yet understood that there's this channel. You know, it's like first you learn to write. Maybe you learn to program in some low-level language or something. Um, and then what are you going to write about? Well, that's a different thing. That's computational X for some X. And the thing that's sort of I've been interested in is, yes, we've actually got a solution to this problem of, you know, the mismatch between computer science education and computational X learning that people really want to do. We've actually got this technology stack and deployment mechanisms and so on to actually deliver something that can le let people learn computational X without learning computer science. And so it's one of my challenges for the next few years. It, it's kind of a frustrating situation to be in because, you know, I can go talk to university presidents, things like that. I know a bunch of them. And, um, you know, it's like they say, yes, it's a problem for our university. We've got all these students who want to study computer science. And, and it's like, well, yes, I, I know there's a solution to this. But, you know, the bad part of this is, but it's this technology that I just spent most of my life building. Um, and it's like it'd be better if other people could explain this point because it's kind of like, like, um, uh, it seems self-serving, although it doesn't make any difference from a, you know, these universities already have like site licenses for our products and things. So it's not really a, it has no, uh, no particular, you know, it has an intellectual point, um, which is usually a, um, but uh, anyway, so, so one of the things that I'm, I'm actually not really looking forward to, but I may end up spending some of my time doing is uh, sort of um, communicating this idea that, yes, computational X is learnable without learning computer science. We've got this path of learning computational language rather than learning programming languages that lets you do that. Um, and uh, so the question is sort of, okay, what do you teach in that? You know, I wrote this elementary introduction to Wolfram language. I have been toying with writing some kind of, I've actually been toying with doing this for, for decades, but some sort of introduction to computation type book I, you know, I, I feel I'm writing it by default because I feel like uh, uh, I, ca I think I can do a good job. I think I know a bunch of stuff about that's relevant to it, but it's kind of disappointing that I have to write it. But I think I'm I'm going to end up probably doing that. So th so that's another one of my one of my projects. I think um, uh, the um, in terms of um, um, uh, you know in, in terms of sort of the whole Wolfram language. Um, um, stack, you know, we recently finished my 1991 to-do list. It was kind of disappointing today to find a bunch of things from 30 years ago that we hadn't really done yet. Um, so there are, there are plenty of things to do there. Um, I think that, um, uh, well, there are a few particular directions that I'm, I'm particularly interested in, um, in terms of extending the language. I mean, one is I want the language to be able to talk about sort of everything in the world. And that means that, you know, atypical conversations that humans have in natural language I would like to be able to capture at least the essence of that computation conversation and represent it in computational language. And so I've been thinking about that for a long time, actually since about 1979 or so, um, of this question about how do you take sort of general purpose human thinking and represent it in computational language form? Um, and I, the frustrating thing is that I haven't seen a use case. That is, and I found that this kind of, let's just imagine how you would do it in the abstract it doesn't usually end well. And so I've been waiting for a long time for a sort of concrete use case for, so why does it matter that we can represent, you know, human preferences about, you know, I like chocolate or uh, things about, um, uh, or other, other things like this, um, computationally, why do we care? And sort of interesting in recent times, this whole idea of computational contracts, sort of it branched off from things like the smart contract idea from blockchains, uh, but it really has, it's a much more general idea than something specific to, you know, putting data on a, you know, persistent ledger and things like this. 
it's an idea of if you do something like write a contract in legalese, it's sort of you're sort of writing it in a code, but it's a code that has some wiggle room and it's in English or whatever language you're using. Um, and uh, the question is, can you write that contract in computational form? And can you have it so that that contract is automatically executable by computers? And of course, the, the nature of the contracts one would write will be a little different because when you write a contract in, uh, uh, in standard legalese, you're kind of imagining the way that that contract will actually be understood by people and how it will be uh, handled if people don't agree or are confused or whatever else. If it's just in code, it's just going to be crunch, crunch, crunch. The computer is going to do what you tell it to do. Um, but one of the questions is, so how do we take, how do we write in computational language the things that we want to have happen? And so I've been interested in that, and we've been slowly working our way towards that, um, uh, particularly working on blockchain-related things, because that's a place where people really understand that this computational language, uh, computational contracts idea is important. And kind of one of the things, one of the things that's been interesting as we sort of develop both language is seeing the idea of computational language deployed in these different settings. So first of all, it was just, you know, desktop. First of all, back 30 years ago, it was just, you know, you're typing a line of text, something is happening on the screen. Then there were GUIs. GUIs introduced a whole new set of kinds of ways to think about computation. Then, well, then there was ubiquitous networking, then there was uh, mobile, then there was cloud, sort of this persistent store of computation where you can rely on, you know, it's a UUID, we can find it everywhere type thing. Um, the uh, And now with things like blockchain, there are yet different factorings of this idea of computation. So I think the one with blockchain that's particularly interesting is the idea of autonomous computation, that it's just, you know, you set up a bunch of contracts and you just say, okay, world, have the have these things be the way things work. And then off it goes autonomously and just things happen in the world. Uh, there's no human who said, go do this, at least not any time close to when the actual uh, actual thing happened. And that's, of course, you know, as we start thinking about AI and the whole, oh, you know, uh, how do we teach the AIs to do things we want them to do? Computational contracts become critical there because that's the story of kind of how do we globally tell the AIs what we want them to do? And so I've been interested in recent times, particularly, well, it's kind of shocking because I discovered, as I was mentioning earlier today, I said I've been interested in AI ethics in recent times until I discovered the speech that I gave when I was 12 years old, which is about AI ethics, um, and uh, which I don't agree with all of now. Um, I've learned a few things since then. Like well, at that time, I hadn't even touched a computer. So it was, um, uh, so I, I had a disadvantage at that point, but still. It, it's um, actually in that um, in that speech I was talking about kind of what you should leave to humans and what you should automate. I'm not sure I would draw the lines in exactly the same place today, but I think that's a, a, an interesting question. And kind of the you know the global picture is humans set goals because there aren't absolute goals. The goals that we have are goals that we choose as humans to have. There aren't. It's not like mathematics can prove these are the goals you should have and. And if you, if you think you've got a system where mathematics is proving the goals you should have or science is proving the goals you should have, you're doing something very wrong. Um, I think that that's a, because there is an infinite space of these possible goals and the ones that we, we humans pick out are the ones that are sort of coincidentally picked out by us as a result of our history, culture, biology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the, um, um, so, you know, the, 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 the part of what we have to do is figure out um, how do we uh, how do we take those human goals and bottle them up so that we can tell it to the AIs and have them do things the way that we want to have them done? And of course, one of the questions there is, okay, so you're imagining there's an AI ethics, and people say, okay, let's let's put in a you know an ethics system into all the AIs. Well, the problem is there are seven billion people and they have lots of different beliefs and they may act in ways that aren't the same as what they say they believe, and they may aspire to things that are different from what they do and all these kinds of things. And it's a big, complicated mess to figure out, you know, what is the ultimate ethics for the AIs? And I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's probably a good thing for the world that the world isn't completely homogeneous, because I think there would be very little innovation in the world if it was completely homogeneous. I mean, we see that phenomenon as you see areas of science, for example, 
It's like people are saying, it's a big success. This is now a big area. There are zillions of people working on it. And it's like this, the, some people would say, hmm, well, that's scary because it means that there won't be much innovation anymore in that area because by the time you've got 100,000 people, a million people working in some area, you'll have all kinds of institutional structure and so on. And that, that crazy thing that happens, you might think the more people, the more flowers will bloom. I think my observation tends to be the more people, the, the harder it is for a flower to bloom, so to speak. So it's, it's often a, you know, and, and I think it's even been true in, in these areas of sort of computation, computational X. It's a kind of be careful what you wish for, because um, uh, when it gets too big, it's kind of unwieldy. And I think, I think when it comes to things like sort of the ethical systems of the world or something, it's an interesting phenomenon that there are like 200 countries in the world. And why is that number not one or five or 10,000? Um, and uh, it's an interesting question how that relates to kind of the ability for uh, for sort of uh, civilization to evolve, adapt, etc., um, and I think uh, you know it would be it would be a big mistake to just say, okay, uh, you know, human species, we're going to lock in sort of the computational ethics for for the rest of eternity, and it's going to be this. So I, I've sort of gotten involved in a corner of that recently, which is um, the whole business with content selection businesses, and you know the the Facebooks and Googles and Twitters of this world and so on, which are kind of selecting content for everybody. And it's like, how do you do that? How do you, how do you figure out um, how to give people the stuff that they should get and how to not give them the stuff that they shouldn't get? And I kind of, um, I, I ended up getting roped into um, uh, giving some testimony at the US Senate about this. And I was, I was kind of uh, concerned that I would show up and you know, they were interested in, can you just sort of open up the AI and check that it isn't doing anything bad inside. It's kind of the idea, you know, we can't do this with humans when you say, what was your intent in doing this? And the human says, well, it was this and this and this. You might say, well, can we just open up the brain and see what the intent was? Well, that doesn't work with humans. But with AIs, maybe you could just do that. Maybe you could just say, let's open it up and just see, see what it was thinking. Well, that's, that's both uh, practically and theoretically a hopeless thing to try to do. So. I was kind of disappointed that it was like, I'm going to come and say it's all hopeless. And so I thought I'd better come and figure out what might be possible. And I realized that it's actually, I think, rather straightforward to imagine some, some system where kind of the final ranking of content is done by some, each person can pick uh, from a collection of what amounts to sort of brands that have done that ranking and where those brands stand for something. You know, they stand for the most accurate um, uh, kind of reporting of the world, where they stand for the broadest-minded view of the world, or they stand for, you know, some particular kind of thing, or they stand for uh, having you as, as little addicted to media as, as possible, or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, you know, what I then realized is it's another one of these computational contract AI ethics problems, because what you've got to do is to kind of take, uh, you know, whatever media company or whatever, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, non-profit or whatever it is and and say you know you you have preferences and beliefs about what people should see should they be shown this or that kind of shocking or content or content that somebody thinks is shocking or, or not or should they be exposed to it as a who knows what um, and uh, so there's the question of sort of how do you how do you figure out what to do and um, how do you, because those decisions have to be made billions of times. It's not like a person can go through and sit in some meeting and say, yes, I, I think this content is good. No, I think this content isn't good. You have to automate that. You have to have an AI that does it. And so then the question is, can you kind of take the preferences of uh, a brand, for example, and bottle that up as an AI and use that for everybody to select content that way? And I think the answer is definitely yes. And, uh, and perhaps I'll get involved in doing that. We'll see how um, how it how it actually works in the world. I have to say that that idea has gotten a lot more traction than I kind of imagined it would because I was just like, I'm going to find some solution here because I don't want to show up and say it's all negative. I'm just one of these um, intellectuals who says everything is impossible type thing. But um, I think that idea is is really uh, it's actually it's a good idea. It's a fairly obvious idea in my opinion, um, and it looks like it is getting some good traction in the world. So we'll see what happens with it. Um, I think that um, uh, this this whole idea of making what I call a symbolic discourse language, 
of making a language to express uh, kind of everything that we talk about in the world. This is a really interesting problem. It's sort of a generalization of things that I've been doing for years with our computational language. And I'm really hoping to have a chance in the next few years to actually do the symbolic discourse language project. It's a project people kind of started in the 1600s, didn't finish at that time. It's been kind of languishing for a few hundred years here. Um, I think we can now do it. Um, I think I'm probably uh, probably the best equipped person right now, given the particular history that I've had in doing language design and so on, to actually execute this. Um, and so I'm going to try and do it. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. On the one side, we've got computational contracts. We've got the AI ethics stuff. We've also got some very pragmatic things about, um, uh, like, menus for food for, um, and or food preparation methods and things like this, where you're kind of describing procedures. Um, and it's somewhat the same kind of thing. Um, and it sort of requires the same kind of symbolic discourse language ideas. So I think that um, that will be something I'm hoping to start working on. I've been doing a little bit of stuff on it, but I'm hoping to start much more seriously working on it. Um, you know, one of the things that is an important issue for somebody like me is, you know, what stuff should I work on because nobody else is going to do it? And what stuff can I basically just, um, uh, you know, just wait for it to just happen in the world? And sometimes there are things where I've initiated something and it's like, I think it's kind of inexorable that eventually this is something that will happen in this and this way in the world. And I can push and I can kind of uh, jump up and down and try and explain to people how important it is and nothing much different will happen. You know, things will take 20 years to happen and maybe I can cut two years off that uh, by spending, you know, several years of my life, you know, putting a lot of effort into it. And, and I, you know, when one can recognize that, it's like, from my point of view, it's like, I'll just let the world do its thing and not um, uh, not push too hard. On the other hand, there are things where um, um, it's, uh, you know, I'm really quite interested in them, but the world just hasn't got to the point where one can do them. I mean, like a couple I've thought about for a long time. Uh, one of them is kind of nanoengineering. Um, so the question is, you know, can you really make stuff at an atomic scale and um, uh, you know like in, in biology we are kind of big molecular computers where we're actually doing non-trivial things at kind of a molecular scale but we're not yet at the point where our engineering can reach that um, and so the question is is there a sort of general framework for doing that and I think some of what I've learned from NKS and sort of exploring the computational universe and learning what simple programs can do is actually you can teach really simple stuff to do really sophisticated things that's kind of one of the lessons of the idea of computation that, that, you know, even there are things like universal computers that you can build even out of pretty simple stuff. And I, you know, I kind of think that if we're looking to the distant future, it's like, like, um, uh, back in when I was a kid, it was like computers were really rare. It was like, you didn't see a computer very often. It's a big deal to see a computer. And then, you know, in today's world, well, I don't know how many computers we have, a hundred billion, a trillion computers, maybe depends on what you count as a computer. Computers are pretty common, but um, uh, you know we we are exposed to them many times a day. But but it still isn't the case that the typical stuff we have is kind of made of computers. The typical materials we deal with are still not programmable materials. They're still not atomically programmable, so to speak. I have no doubt that eventually the idea that things aren't all made of computers will seem very uh, very antiquated. Um, and one will expect that any any object will be programmable, even at a, a, a atomic or molecular scale. And that's an interesting thing. And it's interesting to try and think about, particularly when we take this idea of computational language and we try and map it into something like what happens at a molecular scale. You know, how do we take the ideas that we humans want to do and how do we think about them when everything is made of computers um, and when everything is made of computers that we can program? Uh, and so I've thought quite a bit about that, and I've sort of thought about, should I get involved in the actual process of making things you can program at a molecular scale? And, well, the answer is, it's, the world isn't ready yet, because, you know, I've thought about this for, oh, I don't know, 40 years now, and, um, you know, it's at any given time, it's like, okay, what can we do? Can we make this out of, you know, carbon structures? Can we make this out of uh, uh, some kind of... Um, uh, I don't know, quantum dot thingy or something. Um, and the answer is it's just not ready. And there's a lot of sort of infrastructure development that's needed. And there will come a moment when one can really look at it and say, yes, there's an architectural set of designs that have to be made. And perhaps 
as I'm talking about this, I'm thinking to myself, perhaps I should at least write down what um, uh, uh, you know what one can figure out about so what what the architecture of what the world is like if everything is programmable looks like. Um, but in any case, that's a that's a thing that I'm. I don't think the ambient technology is ready. I mean, something like the symbolic discourse language idea. Okay, it's been 400 years since people were talking about that, but we're ready. I mean, the infrastructure is ready. The deployment mechanisms are ready. You know, it's time. We can do this now. So another one that I think is a little bit shorter term that I've long been interested in and, and just haven't um, uh, haven't really pursued is uh, general purpose robotics. So, you know, when we have computers, the thing that really made computers take off is the fact that you can make a general purpose computer. You can make a computer where it, the hardware is fixed, but you can program it to do anything. With robots, that's just not the case. You can have, you know, you have a robot arm, it does its thing, you can program where the robot arm goes and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you go to a robotics trade show, there's, you know, there's the, there's the legs aisle, there's the hands aisle, there's the arms aisle and so on. It's not a general purpose thing. And I've long thought that, you know, I've sort of imagined it's this giant thing made out of initially sort of like sugar cube sized things and then maybe eventually molecular scale things. It's, it kind of looks an awful bit lot like life actually by the time it's molecular scale. But um, uh, you know, where, where it is configurable in the physical world to do whatever you want it to do. Um, and so I, you know, about a decade ago, I, I uh, uh, got somebody to look at sort of the geometry of how you'd make objects that could sort of Rubik's Cube around themselves to change their configurations in all kinds of different arbitrary ways. But it kind of got stuck on how do you deliver power to these things? You know, electro-permanent magnets aren't strong enough, all this kind of stuff to, to keep the thing in, in, in configured properly and so on. And I, it was kind of like one of these, the ambient technology isn't quite there yet. I mean, eventually it will be there and it will be completely revolutionary because there's so many things in the world that require sort of physical, uh, sort of physical action um, and uh, that, um, uh, that we, what we still do with humans um, and we could automate this. I mean, of course, one of the things that, you know, as, as somebody like me is kind of pushing for automate more and more and more stuff, um, it's like, okay, what do the humans do? When you've automated everything, I, I think you know I'm, I'm I'm much less pessimistic about that than many people are because I think that if you look at the activities we do today, so many of them would have seemed utterly meaningless even a hundred years ago, um, and but they're made meaningful by this whole stack of sort of developments of our culture, um, and they're meaningful to us now, and I think that um, as we automate more, we're kind of just building a bigger and bigger platform to essentially take human preferences and human goals and uh, implement them. And then a lot of what happens is, well, humans have to decide what they want to do, but that's been true throughout human history. Um, but we get to do richer, more interesting things as we get to automate more stuff. So I, I, I guess I'm pretty optimistic. I also happen to have, a, I would say, a very um, optimistic view of, of the fact that there's, there's niches in the world for, for everyone even when they don't think that there are. And you know, you can be lucky or unlucky in the time in history in which you live or whether your particular niche is, uh, is wide open right now. You know, I've been lucky that the, the computation niche has been open. The you know, find the source of the Nile niche was closed. Um, not that that was something I've been terribly interested in, but you know, like when I was a kid, I was interested in space and I could have been like, um, uh, you know, I really, really, really want to go explore Ganymede or something. That's the real thing I want to do in my life. And sorry, but I've lived at the wrong time in history for that to be possible. Um, and so, you know, one can be lucky and unlucky with these kinds of things. Uh, that, that's one I haven't particularly missed. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but anyway, so, so um, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of these other things that are sort of projects I, I thought about, I mean, another one that I've been interested in is the General Purpose Sensor Project. So, you know, you have slightly more, I think this is definitely a doable project at this point. Um, I don't know how, uh, the question is, you know, we have general purpose computers, but we have, you know, we have sensors like video and, and sound and, and so on. The question is, if you want to measure something in the world, you know, you want to measure airspeed, how do you do that? Well, you could probably measure it with a microphone and some other stuff without having an actual anemometer there. And so the question is, what's the kind of global framework, global network of um, uh, 
of kind of measurement devices, sort of core measurement devices? Are there a dozen sort of basis measurement devices that you can use to kind of measure everything? And kind of my criterion was the stuff you can get to plug into your sensor is stuff you can buy at your average hardware store without having to get anything electronic or, well, that's, I guess, your average hardware store is full of electronics now. But but um, uh, maybe I don't get out enough to know. But um, I, I think that um, uh, it's um, where well, you're kind of just dealing with, you know, a tube that connects this to this rather than a whole sort of computer and, and sensor device and so on. But in case, so there, there are... Um, there are these things, and you know, some of those projects, like that particular project, I've, I've, you know, that project is only worth doing if there is sort of a distribution channel for it, and a sort of big enough maker of hardware stuff who's behind it to have it really uh, go places and to have it really be doable, because it's something where it's going to be a bunch of sort of hardware R and D, um, and uh, you know, while one can figure out a certain amount about how it will be possible, I think actually doing it requires sort of aligning some some player um to to uh to get behind it you know something like symbolic discourse language doesn't need that i've i've you know i've got the stack that's needed to do that um so in any case that that's um uh you know th this is always one of the one of the challenges and, and it's also the case for for me for example is okay there are big projects i can do and there are small projects i can do and it's kind of a a one of the mistakes to make if you're trying to in my view, at least, trying to lead an interesting life is to say, well, one thing to do is say, oh, I got good at doing that. Let me just keep doing that forever. Well, arguably, sometimes when people say, what do you do? Well, I say, I run a company. I've been doing that for 32 years. It's the same company. We make the same stuff. And it's like, eh, that's kind of boring. But it isn't because we're ending up doing, you know, we've been very innovative over that period of time. And while the matrix that I built is the same thing, that matrix has, is very rich in terms of what can be put into it. And I mean, in fact, in general, what I've found is that that kind of the the key thing in in terms of figuring out what to do is I have to have sort of a matrix into which to put what I'm doing. So, for example, there's a whole class of ideas that I can have that sort of fit into the matrix of it's going to be a feature of orphan language. There's another whole class of ideas that I can have that fit into the matrix of I'm going to write a blog post about those. Um, and there are a few other of these matrices. But if I do something like I say, okay, I'm going to invent, uh, well, even some of these things like general purpose robotics, I don't really have a matrix into which to put that. And, you know, I have all kinds of random ideas that, uh, you know, I were, if I were a different type of character, I would be off, you know, filing all kinds of patents and all kinds of random ideas that I have. I don't really have a matrix into which to put those. They're just sort of things I do that are just out there and don't really have a way to, to get legs, so to speak. And so one of the one of the things is that I, I like to sort of concentrate the things I do in areas where I think I have an existing matrix where the effort that I put in is well leveraged by the by the sort of structure that I've already built, and um, that's uh, uh, so you know that's kind of one of my criteria for what to do. Another thing is um, don't always try to do a thing that is uh, you know sometimes it's like okay I've I've done some cool things now the next thing I do has to be even bigger even cooler than everything I've done before. It turns out it's hard to predict what's going to be even bigger, even cooler. And plus, that's kind of a formula for getting yourself kind of locked up in, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't do anything because I have to do something bigger. Um, I just do things that uh, I can see are doable. Now, most of these projects that I do, I don't ever imagine, you know, if somebody had said, are you, you know, project yourself 30 years in the future, are you still going to be doing Wolfram language development? I would probably have said, "Oh no, it'll be finished long before then." You know, I can. I'm probably a, a uh, an uncontrollable optimist about these things. I never get into projects where I where I think it's going to be an infinite project, even though I plainly know, uh, you know, from my history and general history that these projects are, in a sense, infinite projects. But I think that, that having a certain degree of optimism about, no, 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 it's really doable, is very important. I mean, I, I think in leading these projects. The most important thing is just the belief that the project is possible, because I think that the um, uh, you know once you believe it's possible, then you figure out how to do it. If you're like, no, 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 I just don't think it's possible. You know, we got to do a scaled back version because that's just not possible. That's the formula for not actually trying to do the thing. I mean, I, I guess my my personal favorite is always kind of what I view as sort of the creation of alien artifacts, things where 
if I do them, people would say, oh, that's pretty cool. But where they wouldn't, if I didn't do them, they sort of wouldn't exist and people don't expect them to exist, so to speak. So, you know, if I, if I look at the kind of things that I do, so I, I've been, one area that I've been doing a certain amount of is writing. And if you saw the earlier part, earlier live stream, I, I guess I've been into writing since I was a kid, um, although I haven't really done it seriously, so to speak. Um, but uh, I write, uh, well, I can write fairly quickly. When I wrote the NKS book, I spent 10 years doing it and I wrote at the rate of about, you know, less than a page a day. Um, and that was very hard going. And it was also because I was trying to figure everything out at the same time. But, um, you know, when I write blog posts and so on now, I write them comparatively quickly. Um, I have to because I generate, I seem to, I seem to evolve to um, 13,000 words seems to be my typical output, which is kind of outrageously long. But, well, you know, the scroll depths aren't too depressing when we look at the web analytics of these things. So I figure that that's, that's a decent sign. But in any case, I, I'm, I'm um, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping to do is write more because I kind of like writing. I think I've got a bunch of stuff to write about that people find kind of fun. And, um, and also, it helps me organize my thoughts. And it, there are many, many, many things that I figured out where I didn't really figure it out until I tried to write about it. It's just like when I, you know, I tell people when you're doing, uh, you're doing some computational investigation or data science or something like that, you can say, oh, I'll, I'll figure it all out and then I'll make the great visualizations at the end. Well, actually, that's a big mistake because it's like make the visualizations, make the great visualizations when you're in the middle of doing stuff because then you'll look at those visualizations and they'll help you understand what's going on just as they'll help other people understand what's going on uh, kind of um, when, they, when they look at what you've done. But um, in any case, so... You know, so there are these these things like writing, which and you know some of these blog posts that I write um, are, um, oh, you know, I'll write them about all kinds of stuff and um, I, a bunch of historical stuff, historical biographies. I'm afraid one of the demographics of having started my career young is a lot of people who I know are, are dying, and so I end up writing a bunch of obituaries. Um, I find that interesting. I mean, I I think that. Um, uh, and I also, um, uh, you know, I find people interesting. I mean, I suppose another thing that in terms of my personal activities, um, you know, I'm, I, I like education. I didn't like education when I was younger. When I was younger, it was like when I was supposed to be a professor, it was like, oh, this is really tiresome. I don't really want to do this at all. Um, you know, I'm just going to do what I have to do, but I'm not really into it. Um, now I find sort of actual education really pretty interesting. And, you know, we have the summer school and summer camp, which have been great over the course of many years now. Um, and that's always sort of a fun time for me, three weeks and two weeks of, um, well, three weeks altogether of kind of extreme educational professoring type stuff of figuring out, you know, projects for a hundred and something people and um, interacting with all of them and so on. It's great. Um, I don't think I could do it all the time, but it's great while I do it. Um, I think I've also, um, uh, you know, when I think about, I've talked about sort of computational X and um, uh, education about computational language and so on. There's a lot of important things to do with that in the world. But frankly, you know, actually um, going and injecting this into the K through 12 world, for example, it's really painful for somebody like me. I'm not, a, you know, the things I, you know, I steadily as I, as I get more ancient, I learn more about myself and what I'm good at doing, what I'm not good at doing. I'm okay at, at figuring out new stuff. And like, when nobody knows what to do, I can figure out something to do. And when, you know, that's the, um, uh, and I'm, I'm okay at, at leading other people to, uh, to help get things done. And I think, um, I think we managed to do interesting and good things in the world. When it comes to, oh, you're going to be part of some giant system that requires building consensus and, you know, being on committees and things, I'm useless, you know, completely useless. I, I'm, I find it frustrating. I kind of, um, uh, you know, I've, I've agreed to be on a few boards, although I may stop doing that soon. Um, and it's kind of like I'm either, I'm either talking all the time or I say absolutely nothing. And I'm kind of off falling asleep type thing. Um, but so, so you know, not not my kind of thing. So I kind of have to learn which battles to pick. And I think the you know help reform, help inject computation into the K through twelve world, which it desperately should be in. I mean, there've been like five waves of let's teach programming. They've all pretty much failed. Um, the you know the risk in these things is 
you know, have programming be like learning math, where the main meta message is people don't like math. Um, and that's what happens if you do it in the wrong way. And I think, you know, the set of people who really need to learn to be software engineers, well, it's a great thing to do. I think it's great. I enjoy it myself. But it's not, it's not everybody. Um, although the paradigm of computation, just like the basic ideas of mathematics, are something that everyone should know. And it's important to kind of existing in the modern world, and it will be increasingly important. And I think that sort of teaching computation and computational thinking is really critical. Um, and I think, you know, we happen to have built the tools that make this kind of possible in a really good way. But actually making that deployed in sort of the K through 12 world, that's a painful process. For, for somebody like me, it's a poor match. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much hoping that that will happen, um, uh, uh, you know, without the, the, so, you know, the tools we built will be able to be deployed that way without me personally having to be the one. And I don't think I'd be very good at it. I mean, my younger brother, Conrad, is, is, uh, uh, has done quite a bit on this, and he's actually good at it, um, at actually you know, figuring out how to sort of uh, connect all this stuff to the actual world of governments and um, school systems and all this kind of thing. I'm not. I'm useless at that. Um, and, uh, but, but anyway, the, the, I find the actual, I find the ideas of what one might teach interesting, and I find the, um, the actual process of doing teaching quite fun. Um, I don't think I could do it, as I say, all the time. I've been, for the last several years, every every Sunday I've been doing a little thing with uh, some middle school and some older elementary and younger high school kids of computational adventures, so to speak. And um, I might be the, the world's most tangent, tangent um, uh, taking um, uh, sort of teaching person, but the kids seem to find it fun. And I certainly find it very interesting. It's fascinating to see what, um, you know, I always learn a lot by by even the, my process of trying to explain some some random thing to kids and their response. They're typically very kind of um, uh, fresh and new response to whatever one's trying to explain. Um, so that's uh, so I, I'm actually hoping to do more of that. I've been I've been really interested in in the problem of uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, it's like I, I've 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 um, I've done a fair amount of mentoring of um, actually for 50 years now with um, uh, mostly two categories of people. I, I just wrote about this recently in a, in a, uh, a post I wrote. Um, the, you know, it's ended up being mostly, mostly two categories, CEOs and kids, who actually have a strangely similar situation. They're both in a place in life where they can kind of uh, you know, choose the next step themselves in some first approximation. They kind of... Uh, are thinking, you know, I could do anything. What should I do? And that's always an interesting sort of moment to mentor about. And I, I find that interesting because I, I find people interesting. And I've been, um, uh, you know, I've been kind of watching the trajectories of people over a long period of time. I've kind of stayed in touch with uh, oh, a large fraction of people I knew in elementary school and things like that. And it's been fascinating to watch kind of the, the trajectories unfold and the, the fact that people are still the same people uh, you know, at age 60 that they were at age 10 or something, and they, they have a lot of the same traits. And the, the real question is, can you take those traits and map them into the world in a, in a, in a useful way? Um, the, uh, um, uh, I think that that's some... Um, uh, so, so anyway, I think um, um, the... Um, uh, so, so one of the things, that, anyway, I've been interested in is um, uh, kind of how do you... Um, uh, how do you kind of take all these ideas about things one can do and so on, and how do you make those as broadly accessible to, for example, kids, independent of whether they come from sort of fancy circumstances or not? And I guess I've been, I've discovered how fragmented the world has become because even though I've, I've made some effort to kind of, um, uh, you know, mentor kids or deliver sort of stuff to, to kids who aren't in sort of the, the most upscale circumstances has been remarkably difficult to do that. And that's, that's something I'm kind of hoping to do more of in the next few years, just because I find it interesting. I'm learning a lot from it. And um, uh, somehow it, um, it makes me feel, uh, well, I just find it, um, I find it fulfilling and interesting. I wanted to talk about, um, uh, I'm, I'm almost finished with, I, I didn't think I would yak on for as long. This is what, this is what happens when I'm, I'm like, 
every post I write seems to end up as 13,000 words. I have the same kind of um, same kind of thing, I suppose, in this in this way. But but um, uh, I want to talk about um, one big project that I'm trying to do that is about to get really launched is something that I've been interested in since I was a kid, um, which is physics. I mean, I worked a lot on physics. I used to do particle physics. I think I was even pretty good at particle physics back when I was a teenager. Um, I stopped doing it basically when I stopped being a teenager. Um, and uh, I was in it when it was kind of during its golden age when, um, um, and lots of stuff I discovered when I was a teenager, people still think is relevant today, which is really nice. Um, but anyway, I'd been sort of interested in fundamental physics all that time. And I, I didn't think I had that much to contribute in terms of, you know, is there really a fundamental theory of physics that can be found and so on? I thought, you know, I, I know I'm okay at doing quantum field theory or whatever else, but it's like I didn't have any great idea about, you know, this is the, the thing that's going to crack open the fundamental theory of physics until probably 20 years ago, no, 25 years ago, maybe when I started working on new kind of science and exploring the computational universe, and I just got a very different intuition about how things work than I had had as a kind of working physicist in the paradigm that's existed for 100 years or so in doing sort of, quotes, modern physics. And so I kind of got interested in, you know, how, how would you build, what could the universe be made of that isn't the kind of standard mathematics of quantum field theory and general relativity and so on? And so, and I realized from, from studying sort of the computational universe, you might have thought if the universe is made from sufficiently simple things that, gosh, uh, you know, it, 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 it can't possibly be a universe that does the things as rich as the things we see in our actual universe. But I realized that intuition is just wrong. I mean, the, the, you know, from these incredibly simple systems, you can get incredible richness of behavior. And if, indeed, some of that richness has some resonance, some kind of... Uh, uh, commonality with what we know is true in physics. And so I've been interested for a long time in, okay, let me take that intuition and see whether we can actually find a fundamental theory of physics based on that intuition. Um, and, you know, the current methods of, of that are used in physics, quantum field theory and general relativity, basically they're both 100 years old. And they've achieved great things during that period of time, but maybe it's time to try a new and different idea and I, I worked out a bunch of these things in my new kind of science book, and some people have even understood what I wrote there. Um, that sounds very condescending, doesn't it? But it, it is a bit frustrating that people people are like, um, you know, they're like, I, I tell them over and over again, you know, there's actually a derivation of the Einstein equations from discrete networks and so on that's in the book. It's like, is it in the book? Is it in the book? Yes, it's in the book. You know, it, I didn't write it out in terms of tensor algebra, tensor calculus, as much as maybe I could have done, but it's, it's in the book. It's described how, how it works. And, um, but in any case, the, um, so I'm, I'm about to actually launch into um, a new assault on the fundamental theory of physics. Um, and uh, uh, I've found a couple of young people who, are, who seem well-equipped to help, which is great. And um, I think um, uh, the, um, and I had about six months ago or so, a new idea about some details about how to actually do it, which I think are kind of nice. It's kind of like, what's the most, what's the most structureless, structured thing that you can imagine out of which you can build uh, a universe? And so I, I sort of had a new idea about that. And um, so anyway, then the question is how to actually do this project. And this has been a big problem for me for a long time because the thing I've noticed is, you know, a lot of projects I do are tool building projects. And basically they have the fundamental response of the world is, uh, you know, thanks for building that tool. We find it useful. That's great. It's nice, positive feedback. Unfortunately, in these things where you're kind of going into, you know, like find the fundamental theory of physics, it's kind of like it's a competitive situation. I don't like those. Um, it's one where it's like like um, people are saying, well, we think we found the fundamental, you know, we think we're on track. String theory is going to do it or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, we don't need all your ideas about doing something different. You know, they're horrifying. You know, we've got this whole structure. We've got thousands of physicists working on all this stuff. We don't need a different thing being talked about. And particularly, we don't need a thing that is paradigmatically different from existing physics and is like incomprehensible to people who have, you know, learned all that wonderful conformal field theory stuff and all these kinds of things that, uh, you know, that actually that one I, 
I know uh, I know less about than I should, but I know I know traditional quantum field theory well, um, and it's in my um, uh, I'm I'm about to uh, kind of I've been asking my friends in string theory and so on when when should I really learn your field and they keep on saying wait a bit wait a bit it's going to be clearer, but I think now I have to do it. Um, but in any case, the the um, uh, you know the sort of the question of how do you do this project because the the worst thing to do is to do a project where everybody hates the fact you're doing the project. Um, and uh, so I finally figured out a few years ago how to do the project, and I, we're going to do it as a kind of public uh, public education project, basically. And we're going to do a completely open kind of live streamed, you know, open code, you know, whatever thing of let's try finding the fundamental theory of physics. And hopefully people will find it interesting to watch because I think it'll be, uh, you know, at the very least, there's going to be a bunch of interesting math and computation, computer science, and so on that comes out of it. Um, you know, we may be, this may be the wrong century to go try and find the fundamental theory of physics. My ideas about it might be just completely wrong, um, but it's going to spin off some interesting things, even if the, the, the core ideas don't turn out to work out. And so, you know, it is kind of fun. I, I have to admit, even in the last few year, days, I've been thinking about universe swag and other kinds of things that one can do once one decides one's going to make this a public project. Um, and uh, anyway, so that, that hopefully will be something that will be coming soon and that I'm really excited about because I really want to do this for a long, long, long time. Um, all right. So um, I uh, um, just... A few last comments I was going to make. I, I you know, in terms of projects, um, uh, you know, I've I've got a lot of stuff that I've done. Whether it's the all of the programs for the NKS book, whether it's all of this archive material, all all these interesting letters I've exchanged with all kinds of well-known people, and all these kinds of things. And it's like one of the activities which is in the along the lines of how much do you build new stuff versus how much you develop stuff that you already have. And so I, I'm I'm going to spend a little bit of effort trying to build a good archiving system. I'm gonna finally, hopefully get um, all of the NKS notebooks, original notebooks sort of cleaned up and put online so people can play with them. Um, I'm, I'm actually taking, you know, I do a lot of demos in a lot of different settings and they're typically, they can be some, some of them are somewhat the same, but a lot of them are very different depending on the audience, the setting and so on. And so I'm going through and sort of uh, clipping out the core of the, the, you know, the collected demos, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, to some extent, I'm also, uh, you know, right now, at, even at my ancient age of, of, of that I am now, I feel pretty energetic and uh, actually probably more energetic than I felt uh, most other times in my life. Um, so that's great as far as I'm concerned. But it's like there are things I want to do now. And there are other things where I say, well, if I feel a little less energetic later, those are things I can still do. And so I'm trying to trying to pace the things that I can still do when I'm feeling a little less energetic, all kinds of writing projects, all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of cute history writing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, expository track projects. I figure I can, I can do those even if I'm not quite as energetic and don't require, don't have quite as much focus and concentration, but, but so far so good. And I'm, I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing all kinds of things. All right. I better, um, uh, I said I would do an AMA. This is a terrible AMA. This is a um, um, uh, AMN. Um, okay, so let me uh, take a look at some of the some of the questions that have come in here. Okay, let me scroll up here. Um, so uh, somebody's noting here that. Um, um, they learnt that in um, in a Chinese tradition, birthdays are counted mod sixty. So to the, a sixty year old is is uh, in a similar category to a newborn. I, that's that's cool. That's that's uh, that's a good theory. Uh, it's like um, uh, in Babylonian times, everything was um, was done base sixty, and the Babylonian symbol. And they didn't have positional notations. They didn't have zeros and things. So the the notation for a for sixty is the same as the notation for one. So it's a good, good kind of birthday, birthday cake, birthday card theory. Okay, somebody's asking, will there be a Stephen Wolfram digital archive like the Turing digital archive? Yes, we are planning exactly that. There's a, there's a, I mean, I have a lot more material, a lot more material. I mean, I've got three, three million emails. I've got um, lots of stuff, and and unfortunately, you know, quite a lot of it is really not exposable. I mean, for 
uh, independent of, of, you know, I, I, I would be a jerk to expose it, so to speak, because it's a lot of stuff about people and things and so on, which are definitely one day, you know, when, when none of the people are around anymore, if that time comes, um, the, uh, you know, I guess might as well be exposed. But uh, right now, one has to kind of pick and choose a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose a bunch of sort of story arcs of these are the thousand documents associated with this particular story arc um, and, uh, and, and not do some other ones. Um, will there be, be, ever be workshops on how to mine the computational universe? Um, well, we, we've, we've done that. I mean, that was kind of the idea of our, our summer school, although it hasn't completely gone in that direction. I mean, the summer school started 17 years ago. It's been very successful. And it really started doing NKS, mine the computational universe type stuff. I would say that the mining the computational universe for technology, we have, uh, we've, that has not been made as systematic as it should be. I mean, that's a, that's a big thing for the future. You know, we've done a lot of that, but we've done it very uh, custom, you know, very bespoke. We haven't really built machinery. We built localized machinery to do that, but we haven't built sort of the global way of understanding, the global way of taking, I mean, in a sense, that hasn't existed for mathematics either. There isn't sort of a global way of taking, um, well, I suppose until until our own efforts with, with you know, Mathematica and Morphine Language and so on, we've done a certain amount of systematization of the way that you can use the ideas of mathematics. So I suppose the way of thinking about this is, you know, when we think about mining the computational universe, what is the human understandable way of, of asking those questions? In other words, we can just say we want this kind of thing, but but how do we how do we think about um, kind of uh, how do we think about doing that mining? What are the primitives? What are the mining primitives that we need? And that's kind of analogous. Okay, so for me, it's turning everything into you know a nail because I have this hammer of computational language. But it's it's kind of the how do we how do we think about sort of language primitives that represent a, a approaches to mining the computational universe? It's a really good question, really good topic. I don't know who asked the question, but um, uh, if you're interested in that stuff, come to the summer school. Let's talk about it. Let's explore that. It's a good thing. Um, okay, next question here from Jesse. If you were to redesign the Wolfram language from the ground up with no regard for backward compatibility, what fundamental syntax changes might you make? Um, I'd probably make a few syntax changes, a few, a few precedence changes. Uh, possibly relative precedence of, of arrow and ampersand might be one of them. Um, you know, I think an awful lot of that stuff. I mean, that one will get papered over with with um, uh, auto suggestion stuff. Um, I would say I might have taken I might take associations more seriously from from the beginning. I mean, associations uh, that was a funny thing because we had a thing like associations in SMP. They were called projections. And they went horribly wrong in various ways because I tried to merge them with the idea of, of ind indexed vectors, and that really didn't work. And so I was put off an idea like associations for probably a quarter of a century. Um, and I think those probably should be should be more integral to what goes on. I think in um, you know it's going to be very interesting. There's a there's a there's some levels of Wolfram language uh, uh, sort of you know as we see new input mechanisms, you know, for the language, and as we see more kind of richness in code assistance and machine learning based um, or other sort of ways to suggest about what you should write in your code, I think we're going to learn more about ways that the language could be different. Um, or way, but, but I don't know whether we'll need to change the underlying language. I mean, another thing that I've thought about recently is spoken Wolfram language, which sounds kind of crazy, but it's really useful in educational settings and even in thinking about things internally. And you know, if I'm like away from uh, away from a computer, which is pretty rare, I have to say, um, and uh, you know, and I want to think about some Wolfram language thing, it's very hard for me to hold in my head the the kind of um, you know any long piece of code. And if I had a linguistic, a verbal way to do it, it would help. And so it's kind of like, how do you do it? So, you know, how do you say it's f of x, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've been thinking about you know how to represent it. Uh, verbally, how to represent spoken Wolfram language, um, and uh, I think again that we'll, we'll learn something from doing that and from trying to make the correspondence between essentially human language facilities and uh, faculties and and um, uh, and what we are used to in computational language. I think we'll also learn something as the symbolic discourse language kind of really really ramps up about what's um, what's possible there. 
I mean, there's probably a few syntaxes that I would would uh, would choose to use more sparingly. And you know, defensive syntax design. I mean, it really helped that I'd done SMP beforehand, and there were a bunch of things there that I really didn't like. Um, and so, you know, it was a fresh start with world language. Um, uh, Ali is asking about next big things in Mathematica. Uh, that's a long, long story. I'm, 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 I'd be really happy to talk about that, but, but I think that's this is not the. Um, um, it's, uh, it's a lot of. It's a lot of medium-sized things, and a few frameworks that emerge from from many medium-sized things. Whether it's the you know the whole framework for dealing with real-world data, the whole cloud framework, um, there are there are new frameworks that are emerging, um, and that's uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, okay, Ben is asking what feature for Mathematica has on, been on the drawing board for the longest. That is a very interesting and good question. I should know the answer to that, and I do not know. Um, ba, 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 let me think. Okay, here's one. Here's one, which is still not solved. It drives me crazy. It's about debugging. And it's about how do you see what's going on in a program that's running in Wolf language? What is the, you know, in a procedural language, it's pretty easy. You just step through things and so on. But in, you know, a functional computational language, where there are all these functions running and so on, how do you get an intuitive sense of what's going on? How do you unroll the computation into some kind of, you know, and it, and it becomes even more difficult as things start to be more parallel into this sort of space-time structure that you as a human can look at and say, oh, I understand what's going on. That's been something I've been working on since the time of SNP. It's been 40 years now. And it's like, how can we get something where we can unroll the kind of the computation as it happened and understand it and maybe examine it, you know, make it an encapsulated symbolic thing and understand it. So that, that's been one that, that, um, that I still haven't cracked. And I feel like when one does crack it, it might give one some new ideas about how to do programming. Because it's like, like, you know, if you can unroll the thing and just have say, this is the symbolic thing and it's my program, because that doesn't really work because the whole point is the program can recurse in this place, it can do this, it can have a longer loop, it can have a shorter loop. It isn't just a straight line thing where it's just like, here's my program, be happy type thing. Um, I mean, in, you know, when one looks at block-based programming, um, you know, that, that's something where if you have just this sort of straight line program, it works just fine. It's quite, quite useful and quite nice discovery interface. And we'll probably see some things with Wolfram Language. People have done lots of experiments. We'll probably be building some things uh, more seriously, particularly aimed at some sort of lower level education purposes and a few specific application areas um, for, for that. Um, but I don't think that, that that is only a solution for very simply structured programs. Okay, do I think that holographic non-perturbative gauge theory in lower dimension can be studied using perturbative higher dimensional supergravity using machine learning and AI? Well, that's at least a specific question. Um, Okay, so for example, when I was a kid, I used to like doing computing Feynman diagrams, which are the way of uh, computing, you know, uh, what's the scattering probability for an electron from a this uh, based on quantum field theory, okay? And it gets very hard very quickly. You know, the, the, um, the simple diagrams are fairly easy to compute once you know how to do it, but by the time you get to eighth order, you're talking about, you know, gazillions of operations. And it's probably not the right way to compute these things. Dick Feynman always used to say, even though he invented Feynman diagrams, he used to say, I can't believe this is the right way to do this stuff. Um, and people are getting a little bit closer in modern times with, um, with some of the uh, things that have come out of conformal field theory to maybe saying, okay, maybe this is a way to just like in a big gulp compute everything from quantum field theory. My guess is that there's going to be a limit to that because I think there's going to be computational irreducibility and undecidability, and I think what's going to end up happening is there will be things where there is a sort of a hard, uh, hard lower bound on the amount of computational effort it takes to compute certain things. On the other hand, the actual ways it's being done right now probably aren't the best ways. Now, the question is, can one figure out what the best way to do it is using you know machine learning AI-ish type techniques? Well, really, what those are doing is you know, when it comes down to it, they're doing some sort of interpolation type model of the world. So it's kind of like we're good at doing image recognition because it's like 
the thing looks roughly like a rhinoceros. It's been distorted only in certain ways, so it counts as a rhinoceros. These are the things that modern deep learning and so on are really good at. They're, they're good at sort of interpolating from uh, something with a certain space in which you're doing the interpolation. Somebody asked earlier about using things like solid automata as that underlying space, and we don't yet know how to do the kind of small motions in cellular automaton rule space to be able to do that. Once we do, we'll, we'll have a different set of things that we're able to, to work with. But I think the real question is, is it the case that um, by, you know, do we have the data to be able to interpolate, extrapolate using these kinds of uh, sort of uh, build nested functions, which is what neural nets are um, uh, from, from this data? And I, I tend to think we might have enough data in some areas. Like for example, if you look at the results from Feynman diagram computations, you know, you'll know you sum a million diagrams. And in the end, the answer will be you know, zeta of three minus pi to the fourth over 715 plus you know, some other slightly weird constant. But it's not that complicated. It doesn't look like it's a million diagram type thing. It looks like it's something that there should be a better way to do. And I kind of maybe sort of think it might be worthwhile to take, um, sort of the, all the existing data that there is on Feynman diagrams and just see, you know, it's kind of an outrageous thing, but just see, could you machine learn what the answer is given the Feynman diagram? And maybe it will work better than you think. I mean, probably it's not going to nail it, but it's probably something worth trying. I mean, that's a very sort of simple-minded thing to try, and I doubt it's been tried. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was just looking earlier today as I was looking through my uh, uh, sort of walk down memory lane, I was looking at the... Um, uh, uh, in, this, in the live stream, actually, it's some pages of um, the thing that I tried to construct around 1979, 1980, which was a directory of all Feynman diagrams that had been computed. And now there have been a lot more computed. And that was sort of, uh, that would be the raw material for such an effort. Okay, Richard is asking, what do you think about the Penrose Lucas argument on the non computability of mathematical reasoning? I often think about this in terms of the upper limits of proof theory and automated theorem proving. Um, you know, I, I've known Roger Penrose for a long time. I think he's a fantastic, uh, innovative scientist, one of, the, one, of the, one of the best, actually. I don't think his intuition about what is sort of uh, physically reasonable is, is the best. And I think kind of the, it's got to be quantum gravity in the brain, I don't really believe. Um, John Lucas, I actually uh, knew somewhat. I, um, I, I grew up in Oxford. My mother was a philosophy professor, so I, I met a bunch of the um, uh, the philosophy crowd. Um, and so uh, um, I, 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 mean, I hope I have the right guy, but I think I do. Um, I remember uh, running into him. A bunch of bright people in that. Um, they, they could argue very well about all kinds of things. And I, I, I remember when I was like 10 years old arguing with a bunch of these philosophers about all kinds of sciencey things. And I have to say, that it's a little bit embarrassing to me to remember some of these things because I, I did a pretty creditable job and they seem to have fun, you know, sort of arguing these things with me. But actually, in some cases, they were right and I was wrong in the end. And, you know, I was like, you don't understand the science. And they were like, but there's a bigger picture to this whole thing. And, um, uh, and, and I was like, but I don't think that's, you know, relevant. And it actually turned out that the science wasn't quite as, you know, the assumptions of the implicit assumptions of the science were greater than I had imagined. But in any case, I, you know, look, my working hypothesis is it's kind of Turing machines all the way down. Might be wrong. You know, if, if we succeed in finding the fundamental theory of physics, and it is something that can be represented, in fact, the current, the current hypothesis is something a little bit weird, a little bit different than what people have seen in terms of the way computation works. It doesn't quite fit into the categories one has seen, but it is fundamentally a Turing machine-like thing, but it, I mean, it's not a Turing machine at all, but it's, it's something, something a bit like that. Um, and so, you know, if we're right about what the fundamental theory of physics is, we will know kind of the ground truth. We will know what it is that brains can have in them. Um, and uh, I think that um, uh, the, the, the question of what, you know, for example, when we think about proofs, you know, I wrote a, a piece, oh, a year ago, maybe now, about explainability, and, and proof, because, um, you know, proof is a weird thing. Proof is all about, um, uh, what is proof? What is a proof? You know, you can have a computer verify every step and say, yep, I know it's true. And, you know, whenever we run a computation in Wolfram language, that's what's happening. We know the answer is true, so to speak, because we just ran the computation. 
But then the question is, so how can you convince a person it's true? Well, if you use Wolf Alpha and you use like the pro version for, uh, for students and things, it has these step-by-step -step solutions. And that's like, that's doing, you know, a convince the humans why it's true, explain to the humans why it's true. You know, here's this result, here's this differential equation or something. This is how you get the solution in human digestible steps. The computer computes it in a completely different way. These steps were made purely for human consumption. And that's what proofs are. They are constructing things for human consumption. And now, you know, things I've done, like the, the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra that I found 20 years ago, um, you know, that automated proof, we don't understand the proof. It has 100 lemmas. They just seem like weird, random, bizarre relations. We don't understand what they are. We don't have a sort of cultural understanding. There isn't a narrative. There isn't a story we can tell about what's happening in this proof. And that's really what proof is about. It's about having a story you can tell that humans can understand. Actually, this comes up again in, uh, well, it comes up a lot in this, in AI ethics and so on. It comes up in, you know, what can you humanly tell a story about versus what is just computation that happens? Um, it come up, actually, uh, I'm about to put out uh, my Rule 30 Cellular Automaton, my all-time favorite, favorite science discovery of my life, um, and the thing that kind of really opened up sort of the, the richness of the computational universe to me. Um, anyway, there's a lot we don't know about Rule 30, and I'd been meaning for a long time to put up some kind of prize for people to figure out a few specific things about Rule 30. And I figured, it's really corny, now that I'm 60, I figure out I can put out a, a prize for Rule 60 divided by 230. I was thinking about putting it out today, but, but I decided that's way too corny. Um, but the, the thing is that the, you know, I have three specific questions that to, to ask about for Rule 30, all of which I've been curious about for 35 years. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things is that, that, at least depending on which way those questions go, you know, part of what's needed is I want a proof. And I'm kind of a little embarrassed that I have to say, well, what is a proof? You know, how do I define what a proof is? It's like, well, you put a bunch of mathematicians in a room and you see whether at the end of it, they can explain it to each other or something. That's a very bad operational definition. But, um, uh, you know, I think that the, um, the thing to understand about, about proof and about is that it's, it's, you know, proof is about having a story you can tell that story has sort of has to have components that are understood by sort of everybody who's reading it. So, for example, the way human language works, there might be things that um, are, you know, that exist in the world, and but it's actually hard to talk about them until we have a word for them. You know, it, it's um, uh, once we have a word for a webcam or something like this then we can say, oh, it's a webcam. It's like just like this and that. Um, but until we have that word, we're saying, oh, it's this camera and it's usually used for the web and it's unconnected to a computer and it goes to a such and such port and so on. And it's very complicated. And this, this idea of sort of abstracting things and turning them into words, this is something that happens also in mathematics. It's like, when do we get a level of abstraction that we can then build on? It's also what happens in, in computational language design. It's when do we get this framework, this level of abstraction that we can then build on? And that's, I think it's a very human thing, this, this question about proof. It really reflects on sort of humans and what we build up in kind of the, the tower of understanding that we build in, uh, for us humans. Let's see. Um, let's see. Bobo Momo asks, is it possible to say that evolution prefers computational brains and in the future we will see a dramatic change in human culture which represents the selection? Okay, that's interesting. So I guess the question is, you know, over the course of time, uh, you know, natural selection has operated on humans as other species. I think natural selection, you know, probably in the Western world natural selection, pure, straight natural selection on humans has pretty much stopped. I mean, we've been lucky enough to have medical advances that let us take things that would be, you know, uh, sort, of, sort of lineage stopping, and they don't stop the lineage. So they don't die out in the gene pool and so on. Um, so I think that the, um, uh, I mean, the, the question of, um, um, so I think, um, uh, but there's certainly cultural evolution that continues to happen. 
I mean, there, there might be, you know, this is where sort of the AI ethics and the, you know, who controls what and how does it all work, that's, a, that's very important in terms of how cultural evolution develops. And this question of whether, whether there is sort of a selection effect uh, for sort of the computational understanding brain or not. Well, look, it's, it's interesting. I mean, like, for example, for somebody like me, if I'd lived at a different time in history, I have all kinds of problems. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm able to do some intellectual things, but I'm nothing special when it comes to, uh, uh, I don't know what. Um, well, you know, if it was all about physical strength or, you know, winning a sword fight, I'd lose. So, you know, that, that um, uh, you know, at, at, at our time in history, it turns out, well, it's kind of like the, the geeks and nerds at this time in history, sort of it all looks quite good. Um, and I think that the, um, uh, it's something where, um, uh, you know, in, in there will be some people who are, I mean, the thing to understand is people have such a diversity of skills. And the, the, the thing that I always find, you know, in mentoring and kids and all this kind of thing is, you know, the trick is, can you find that skill? And, and my claim, maybe I'm just an optimist, my claim is that there's enough diversity of skills that are conceivable that everybody's going to have a bunch of them. You know, whether they can find them or not, whether those are things that are valued in the world right now, whether they're things where you really have to bash the world over the head to make it, make it value them, that's a different issue. But, you know, there's, there's enough diversity to what brains do and what people can do that, um, you know, I think there are, um, you know, there are skills to be found, so to speak. You know, the challenge is, can you actually identify them? Do you know, you know, what you learn in school is a very, very thin set of exercising the possible skills that humans have. And even what you learn in school, you don't learn necessarily the right lesson. You know, you're good at math. You like math. What do you actually like? Do you like the aesthetics of math? Do you like the sort of the, the concreteness of math? Do you like the competitive aspect of being able to do math better than other people? You know, there are some essentials there. There is some essence there. But that's a... You know, that's a different thing. And I think this question about, you know, is there a computational brain versus not? I really doubt it. I think it's like that there are, you know, computation is a broad enough thing. It's like, okay, you know, there are people who will be really good at understanding this kind of computational thing. And there are people who will be really good at understanding that one. There'll be people who will be really good at converting, you know, some aspect of human preferences into some sort of computational concept. There'll be people who are, really good at seeing their way through some some very elaborate and complicated algorithm thing or, or understanding some structure that um, exists in some data or even just you know having the right strategy for for building a big system and so on there's a there's a great diversity of things so I, I, I don't think uh, I mean if it turns out that we narrow kind of computational education to the point where all you're doing is writing for loops, then yeah, there probably will be people who aren't very good at writing for loops, just as there are people who aren't very good at you know pushing minus signs around and doing algebra. I mean, I was one of those, um, uh, arguably through lack of attention rather than lack of well, I don't know. I, I'm a, I'm a fairly yeah for people who work with me, I'm a fairly perfectionistic guy, so it's it's not like I'm 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 not the um, uh, the the kind of um, you know the precision of operation. Is not the issue, but but it's still the case that you know if if we narrow what we mean by computation to something that um, uh, that is very sort of plays to only a very specific set of human skills, then we will do that. But we certainly don't need to do that. Um, okay, next question from Richard is about how about automated theorem discovery as opposed to automated theorem proving. Super interesting question. The main issue is you know we can just we can generate theorems, you know, we can spew them out in their trillions. The question is, which ones do we care about? And that becomes, again, a very human question. And I, I have found, you know, to my surprise, I found criteria for, does this count as an interesting theorem? You know, if you just look at the theorems that people have bothered to name, you find that there are, they, they tend to have certain characteristics. They tend to be sort of the simplest representation of, um, uh, of a particular um, uh, of a particular mathematical fact, and, and those are, and that's a, um, um, uh, so, so, you know, this question of which theorems do we think are interesting, we can ask the same thing about, you know, chemicals, which chemicals do we think are interesting? Well, it's always tends to be the same thing. 
It's where have we built a structure where we can make use of this idea or this thing? And in mathematics, what we see happening over the years is more and more structures get built. So more and more different kinds of areas get to be interesting. Like, you know, when Ramanujam was, was generating his, all his weird experimental math results in 1913 and so on, it's like they didn't really fit into anything. It took 50 years before those things, before kind of the, the structure built in number theory really caught up to saying, yeah, that was really an interesting result. Okay, let's see, keeping going. Have I considered bundling Mathematica the way they did, did with Next? Lots of people, um, yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do is um, uh, get Wolfram Engine bundled with all kinds of things. It's bundled with Raspberry Pi computers. It will be bundled with um, uh, more things, I hope, in the future. If um, uh, your friendly operating system vendor or, um, or computer manufacturer, they should come talk to us because we'd love to do that. The Horned One asks, have you heard of Sean Carroll's Mindscape podcast? I have to admit, I have not. I have heard of Sean Carroll. He says, I think you make a great guest. Okay. I am, um, are you still interested in Ithquil? Uh, I think Ithquil is really cool. Yeah, I, I had the pleasure of meeting the, um, the creator of Ithquil a few months ago. Um, Ithquil is a constructed language. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, Esperanto is probably the most famous of these, uh, made in the 1880s. Um, it's a very, um, but um, there are different purposes for making constructed languages. Like you might, might you know, you might make up Klingon or something. Or you might make up a constructed language because uh, it's a cool thing for, I have to admit, I've never watched Game of Thrones, but I know it has a cool constructed language in it. Um, and, uh, uh, but um, in any case, there are, there are several particularly interesting ones, and I would say there, uh, there's, there's one called Tokipona, there's one called Ithquil. Those are two extremes. Uh, one of them has the minimal, it's kind of the minimal language. Ithquil is the maximum language. It's kind of like, can you inventory uh, the uh, kind of all of the constructions that exist in human languages? And can you, um, uh, and can you make, um, you know, like all the tense structures, I don't know, maybe 35 tenses or something, all the case structures that exist, all these kinds of things. And can you, uh, can you, create a language which embodies all of these things, which gives you sort of the maximum expressive power, so to speak. And I think that's really interesting, and it's something that I think can be really useful for this kind of symbolic discourse language direction. The actual Ithquil project, as its creator told me, it's, it's in some ways more of an art project than anything else, because it has, you know, its own weird Klingon-looking, you know, script and all kinds of things like this. That That's, you know, that, I don't think that's core to the part of it that I'm interested in, which is kind of the the exploring the meaning space of uh, what human languages end up being. And I think that's really interesting. And um, uh, I think the um, uh, it's an interesting question whether us humans in, uh, you know, it's like, what can one actually learn this stuff? Like I was, um, uh, I did record a little fragment of the creator of Ithquil speaking some Ithquil and because um, I just wanted, you know, is this actually possible? A little bit difficult. Um, but. Uh, uh, you know that that's it's it's a it's an interesting problem. It's like, you know, what can our brains wrap themselves around? You know, is it the case? Could we end up in a situation like we won't understand a lot of stuff that's going on in AIs, just as we don't understand a lot of stuff that's going on in nature, um, and that's just something to get used to, so to speak. But it's a question of you know what exactly can we wrap our brains around? And for example, you know people say people might say, oh my gosh, education is so much harder today. I'm not sure they do quite say this, although they might do. You know, education is so much harder today because there's so much more to know in the world than there was a hundred years ago when public education started. Um, okay, that may be true, but we kind of know what's important, and we also know much better how to explain. We know the abstractions. We know higher level abstractions. We don't have to teach all that low level, we don't have to teach the details of every single one of these things because by golly, there's a, you know, a piece of science that's been done that gives us the generalized version of that. So it's sort of interesting that there seems to be this frontier of what you need to educate about that maybe stays about the same size over the course of human history. Um, but the level of sort of abstraction that get used change. So there's a question of if you just plunk Ithquil down in front of people, is it learnable or is it too big? 
Or is it something where we have to sort of get to the point where we've abstracted things, and maybe that will happen through computational languages and symbolic discourse languages and so on, um, to get to that point? Anyway, interesting stuff. Okay, SWSH, how would you prove correctness of orphan program on a blockchain? As far as I know, there's no exact executor defined for it as opposed to something like the Ethereum virtual machine language. Yeah, it's a, it's a much higher level kind of thing than something like EVM. What do you mean by correctness? That's always the question. You know, if by correctness you mean you can't double spend, you know, a coin, sure, one might be able to prove that. But if what you mean by correctness is it does what we want, well, that comes back to this whole computational contract question. And, you know, the issue of, uh, there is this trade-off of when things get complicated, it's harder to know what's going on. And yes, I mean, certainly by the time we have in Wolf language functions like image identifier or something that do, uh, you know, machine learning, there's no way we can prove correctness of image identifier. It's not clear what that would possibly mean. Um, so, you know, I think it's, a, it's, it's something where you can say, well, is the hard sort of mathematical construct, um, you know, correctly computed? Yeah, well, I mean, we've been working a lot on a, on a kind of uh, sort of new generation compiler for Wolfram language. I think with that, it will be possible to, quote, prove correctness in the sense of saying, does this program have this property? For sure. I think we will be able to get to the point where we can do that. Now, there'll be plenty of things which, well, there'll be undecidability. There'll be plenty of things where it's like, you know, oh, is there any, uh, you know, where it relates to real world data <clears throat> or where it has machine learning and so on, where the proof of correctness doesn't really mean much. We'll be able to say, does it satisfy this computational contract, perhaps? Okay. Mujtaba Alam. How will computational approaches to biology affect society in the next few decades? Will advances in biotech come from biologists who learn computer science or computer scientists who move into biology? Well, it's an interesting question. Let's take the second part first. So one of the things that, you know, I always watch in the sort of course of, um, uh, well, my life is sort of what are the trade routes, the intellectual trade routes between different fields? And one of the ones that's been there for a long time is physics as an export field. You know, people learn physics, and then they go off and they do biology, they do computer science, they do this, they do that, um, and they start in physics. And, you know, the details of learning about quantum field theory or Maxwell's equations or whatever else it is, for some reason, physics is teaching something that is sort of quantitative thinking, but you can kind of do it flexibly or something, and it becomes a useful export field. I think that computational thinking or some versions of what computer science might be has some signs of turning into a similarly useful export field. And that will mean that most likely what will happen is that that field will sort of export people to a lot of places. Um, I think the, the, the challenge with something like biologists learning computer science or something is that it's like, well, why did they become biologists in the first place? Maybe it's because they wanted a slightly different path. Now, I have to say it's the job of people like me to make the quotes computer science so easy that really it's mostly about kind of thinking about things about biology. I mean, like when Mathematica first came out, theoretical physicists, for example, didn't use computers. I was like the one shining example of a sort of theoretical physicist who discovered lots of stuff with computers. Um, uh, there were others, but, but I was the biggest user of those kinds of things. And your typical average theoretical physicist is like, oh, if I have to do programming, I'm going to find a programmer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we were able to do with Mathematica was get to the point where the typical such person, and it generalized a lot beyond those people, was able with their own fingers to actually take the ideas they were having and put them in computational form. And so I think that's the challenge for, for us with respect to biology is to get to the point where your typical biologist can take their thinking about biology and put it in a computational form. And I think there are, there are things, you know, I would say probably the most interesting thing along those lines is a company called Emerald Cloud Lab, which uh, uses Wolfram language very deeply. It's been building an automated biology and chemistry lab, um, a physical lab, quotes in the cloud, except it's really in South San Francisco right now, um, you know, a big factory-like thing where you, know, you can actually do biology and chemistry experiments by writing code in Wolfram language, and then machines swing into action and do your experiment. 
you know, I'm really hoping, I'm hoping very soon, actually, that I'll be able to do my first serious bio experiment that way. And, and I think that that is probably a place where that may be the nexus where sort of computation and biology really come together, because it really becomes the case that these things that people are thinking about in terms of biological experiments become code, basically. And that becomes the point at which you can really, really bring these things together. Now, the other thing to say is that sort of at a conceptual level, is how do we think about biology? What is, you know, what is the, what are the core concepts of biology? You know, we, you read a medical textbook, it's really complicated. There's all kinds of things, all kinds of details. Um, and, uh, you know, what is the core underlying set of principles? Well, there may not be any. It may just be something that could kind of got patched together by evolution. But, for example, with genetics, back before the 1950s, it was just this very, very complicated field. And then there was this sort of organizing principle of, you know, genetics is about digital information carried by DNA. And that allowed one to understand all these disparate effects and all these disparate kinds of things. And people have said for ages that my whole new kind of science, sort of exploring the computational universe, thinking about things in terms of programs and computation, that that should be a sort of core intellectual way of thinking about a lot of kinds of sort of biological phenomena, like, for example, aging, um, you know, which is a hard to understand biological phenomenon. You know, I've been interested in the aging of computer programs that like you run a, you run a server, it runs for a while and eventually it crashes. And that's like, you know, the, the human runs for a while and eventually they die. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, can you understand how that all works? So I think um, uh, it's kind of like, is there a core way of understanding sort of the global picture of biology using some of these computational ideas? And I don't know the answer yet. I, I had a friend named Sidney Brenner, who is a well-known biologist who died recently, who came to see me every so often and said, you've got to figure this out. You actually have what, you know, what that I, I, I didn't. I mean, and I, I, I have to say, I think there's one of these cases where for me personally, I am better equipped to deal with the tool building than I am to deal with the the kind of the the actual computational X. Uh, I have thought about these things. I just don't think I think there's so much detail there that it's it's hard for me to um, to to get my way through it. Jose asks, "Is it necessary that our uh, AI must have the ultimate ethics? What about a minimum ethical standard?" I think that's a slippery slope. I think, you know, it's like, well, where do we start? Do we start with the Code of Hammurabi? Well, many things in the Code of Hammurabi wouldn't be considered ethically okay today. Uh, you know, I, I, I was interested for a while in sort of curating the ethical systems of the world and saying, you know, well, you know, are there sort of baselines of, I mean, you know, that, that's what, I don't know, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, for example, is a good example of, a, of an attempt to make some sort of uh, baseline. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't know as much about this as I probably should. Um, I am, I'm skeptical that there will end up being a bright line baseline where everybody can say, yes, we definitively agree. Um, because I think as you make it more concrete, there will be things that one has to decide that are where it's like, well, yeah, but kind of in our culture, it doesn't quite work that way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, I have beliefs about, um, and you know, I'm absolutely sure my beliefs are correct, but, you know, so probably, uh, I'm sure, would somebody else be? And, you know, for me, it's like, I believe in humans being treated this way and that way and the other way, but it's like, well, actually, you know, it's, there's a, there's a long history and it's, people don't expect that and whatever. I don't agree with that, but I think it is, um, I think it's, it's a form of kind of um, AI colonization or something to say, just because I don't agree and I'm the one writing the AI ethics guidelines, therefore I'm going to foist this on you. I don't think, I mean, it's not my, not my kind of, um, uh, not my kind of calculation, but it doesn't seem quite right to me. The, Uh, let's see, Ant Colony asks, can you tell us a bit about um, the likelihood of CEO-ness at a young age past the kid-like age? I'm not, not completely understand that question, but, but, you know, I've been, as my wife is fond of pointing out to me, you know, the fact that I've been a CEO for more than half my life has had a deep effect on how I, how I deal with the world. Um, and yes, that's true. I've been, I've been spending, you know, I spend my, um, 
my life trying to sort of make things happen and, and lead things. And I'm not used to, you know, I don't have a boss. And it's kind of like that has all kinds of, um, uh, and I also have this terrible habit of trying to figure everything out for myself, which, which um, uh, arguably, well, is both a good trait and a bad trait. But in any case, the, um, uh, I think, um, um, you know, I first started doing the CEO thing, well, I, my first company, which I started when I was 20, 21 years old, I didn't CEO that because I didn't think I knew anything about CEOing. I thought I was just an academic, intellectual type kid. Um, I brought in a CEO who was about twice my age, who was not hopelessly hopeless. I, I would say he was, ended up being much better at raising money than at making money. And I would say that the sort of vision of the company sort of degraded. But, um, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, uh, by, by CEO standards, uh, not, not uh, better than not terrible. Um, the, um, uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, I, by the time I was doing my current company, I kind of knew the shtick of CEOing. And I kind of had, you know, I, I, in my first company, I was like, I kept on disagreeing with what the management team I brought in wanted to do. And it was kind of like, you know, after you disagree and you turn out to be right enough times, it's like maybe you should just be running it yourself. Um, and then I did a bunch of kind of strategy consulting for companies uh, for a few years. And that was so, super educational in terms of, you know, uh, like I began to think that I might know what I was talking about, about some kinds of strategy things about companies. Um, but of course, it's always very frustrating because you can do, you know, the strategy. If I were thinking about this from the outside, I would tell this company to do this. You say, well, I'm now running my own company. And if I look at it from the outside, I would say, if I were running that company, I would do this. But actually doing it on the ground is often a lot more effort and more difficult than one, one might imagine from just saying, it's obvious you should do this. Yeah, I know it's obvious we should do this. But actually getting there with sort of feet on the ground is difficult. But in terms of, of you know, when I look back of was I, was it inevitable that I would, you know, play CEO for most of my life? Um, the, the answer is probably more so than I imagined. I mean, you know, when I look at when I was a kid, for example, I was always the kid who was organizing stuff, even though I was not like the, um, you know, the, I, I wasn't the kid who was like, you get all of the, um, uh, you know, you become the, 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 you know, the, the, um, it wasn't like the, the system was kind of electing me to, and I, you know, I'm sure if I'd ever run, they didn't have these. They didn't have, you know, run for class president type thing back in back in my day. But I'm sure if I'd done that, I would never have won. Um, my my youngest child recently did one of those and actually won. It's the first time I've ever seen that. That um, uh, uh, I was I was super surprised. But you know, it's not the kind of thing. You know, I would never win one of those things. But on the other hand, I was always organizing stuff and usually organizing stuff of my own design, so to speak. That is, it wasn't an existing structure. It was just like, I want to put together a, you know, a sort of club that does this. I want to organize this, this event. I'm just going to do this. And yes, I did that from when I was pretty young. And, um, you know, I got, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of would lead people to do stuff. Um, and uh, then I think, uh, you know, I think it's, it's one of these things where for me, the kind of the business side of CEOing, I never have thought of myself as particularly talented at that. Um, although I think people tell me that I'm, you know, I'm really quite good at figuring out a bunch of strategy type things. I've certainly figured them out for, for a bunch of other people well. Um, but, uh, you know, I've always discounted that because it's always seemed like it's kind of common sense. Um, and, you know, so it's very hard for me to assess that. The other feature of CEOing is dealing with people. And, you know, I've been managing people for, uh, ooh, how long? More than 40 years now. Um, and uh, you might think that you have seen every conceivable, you know, after that amount of time, every conceivable weird thing that happens with people, you would have seen happen. But no, there's always a new one. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, I would say that I have, uh, because I find people interesting, that doesn't drive me completely crazy the way that it might. I think one of my one of the challenges is if you manage people for a long time, how do you avoid becoming just deeply cynical about people? Um, I think I'm enough of an optimist and I'm interested enough about pe in people that I don't. But um, 
uh, you know, sometimes a bit of a challenge, but, but, um, um, uh, yeah. So I think, um, um, let's see, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the CEOing and what type of people CEO things, it's, it's usually, you kind of have to be prepared to just go and do stuff. You have to have the confidence to just say, we're going to do this. We're going to make this decision. Okay, maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right. If you get more experience, it's probably right more of the time. Um, but, uh, you know, if that's not what you like to do, then it'll drive you crazy because you'll be second guessing yourself all the time and you'll be worrying about things. And it's like, it's, I mean, for me, different kinds of people are good at different things. You know, for me, if I was in some committee figuring something out, that would be incredibly stressful and incredibly difficult for me. And it would just be very constraining and, you know, whatever. And it's much easier for me to say, okay, I'm going to make decisions and, you know, hopefully I'll get mostly right, but I don't freak out, you know, it's some, um, uh, and that, that's a, you know, I, I suppose that's some, and it's helped that over time, you know, one makes a bunch of correct decisions, one doesn't, one gets more confident, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That stuff all helps. So um, let's see. Uh, white tea. What advice would you give to an undergraduate who's just starting to get involved in mathematics and theoretical computer science research? Uh, it sounds self serving, but, you know, learn the whole computational language stack that we've built because it's a secret weapon, uh, still more secret than it should be. And you'll be able to do amazing things. I was just giving advice to somebody who's doing a physics PhD and they're like, like, how am I going to get this finished? Because they want to go on to the next thing. And it's like, you know computation well, just generate a bunch of amazing visualizations and you know, do these sort of computations that for you are totally easy. But for, you know, it'll really impress the people in your PhD committee. Um, it's, you know, there's, uh, there's amazing power that we have in sort of the whole computational language direction. And it's just not, you know, it's only at the very, very, very beginning of being explored. So, for example, in mathematics, doing experimental mathematics, just going out and finding what's true by doing computational things. It's so unexplored, it's unbelievable. Um, I mean, you know, people like Ramanujan effectively did that by hand calculation, and he found all kinds of things. He was, had great intuition as well, but there's a lot to discover there. And I think that that's some, um, uh, you know, there's a, I mean, you say theoretical computer science research. I mean, like, like for example, you know, all of these things like the big prize, you know, P versus NP and all these kinds of things, uh, just go look at that empirically. Nobody has done that. Just go say, you know, if you enumerate all possible programs of this type, you know, just what, you know, how fast can they be and so on. And it turns out that at least the little that I've done in those, in those areas, it's like by actually seeing on the ground how it works, you learn all kinds of things that doing the sort of theoretical work, which has kind of gotten stuck on that particular issue, doesn't really, doesn't really teach you that much now. You know, it did at the beginning, but, but so that's an example. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, let's see, Yundong. Uh, will Wolfram Language develop technology for large-scale finite element simulations? We've actually done that in the last few years. We've actually built, it took us a long time to build up the computational geometry capabilities to do that stuff well. If you look at version 12 of Wolfram Language, it has very serious finite element capabilities. Um, I would say the main issue is connecting it to sort of building your model of the world. Um, but once you've got that built and we've got good geometry description tools now, uh, we can do really well at those things. Uh, let's see. Um, Daniel, how important is the concept of object-oriented programming for Wolfram Language? Well, Wolfram Language is a symbolic programming language. And um, the sole sort of idea of object-oriented programming is there are these things and you have sort of methods that operate on them. I would say symbolic programming really generalizes that idea dramatically. Um, and uh, uh, it's kind of, I, I would say object-oriented program is not as much heard from in these years, um, but I would say that that is sort of a long topic, but I would say that, that uh, the way I see it is symbolic programming lets you generalize those ideas and do all kinds of other things where you can represent sort of anything symbolically. Representing things as kind of objects where you poke them with methods and so on is much less general and much less rich 
than representing things in symbolic form where you do sort of transformations on these symbolic objects. Uh, what are our thoughts? This is from, these names are great, Kung Fu Corgi, okay. I'm just, that gives me an image of something. Um, the, uh, uh, what are your thoughts about prologue as a language and something you may put into production? So I've been interested in that for a long time. Prologue made it, in my opinion, an interesting mistake in language design, which is that it promised something it couldn't deliver. It said, you're going to set up all these, all these goals, and it's going to go through and figure out how to do all of this stuff. The problem was that was kind of computationally infeasible. And so people would write code, and the code they'd write would just be horribly, super exponentially slow. And then they'd get unhappy. And then they'd have to go back to something that was much more procedural and, and straightforward. So in a sense, it was, it was setting itself up for something it couldn't deliver. And I, I, I've sort of taken that lesson as, you know, when you do language design, lead the users as they think about things in terms of your language to do things that the computer can actually do. Don't lead them into, you know, uh, depths of undecidability and, and impossibility because they'll just be unhappy and they won't be useful because they won't actually get to the end result. Now, having said that, we, we've done a bunch of experiments with, I mean, we, we obviously do a lot of stuff that is kind of like goal-oriented logic programming-ish stuff. Um, I would say more directly, there are some particular places where we have thought about putting in something which is very much like that. Um, and probably in the next couple of years, it's, it's sort of on the list right now for some specific applications where it's like, I don't know, visualizations where you say, this is a, these are the set of visualizations I can end up with. These are the data that I have. You know, how do I match those together? That maybe is a case where that kind of method can be useful. I mean, it's not unrelated to some of the automated theorem proof stuff that we have, which is, uh, frankly, uh, I mean, it's, it's useful for automated theorem proving. It's not clear that it has more general sort of applicability across the language, although we keep on finding places where we can make a little bit of use of it. Um, Mohammed, are the building blocks necessary to being able to computationally describe pure mathematics the same as those needed for the symbolic discourse language? No, they are not. They are different. That's a different direction. I have been interested in that problem as well of um, kind of uh, can we add the construct? So we have like 6,000 you know, primitive constructs in Wolfram language. My estimate is with another 1,000 or so, we could capture pure mathematics. So what do we need? We need you know, the notion, well, we have notions now like asymptotically equal to. We might need a notion like, um, I don't know, homotopically equivalent to, which we don't have right now. We might need these other notions that have arisen in pure mathematics, which initially we can just use to describe pure mathematical ideas. Later, we might be able to compute with them. But the first step is just to be able to describe things. And kind of that had been something that I wanted to do in connection with the effort to sort of curate all the theorems of mathematics. So they're about three million published theorems of mathematics. And I, I really was interested in this effort of um, uh, sort of um, uh, organizing all those theorems of mathematics and making them computable, just like we've made computable lots of other kinds of things in the world. Why not take all these theorems of mathematics and make them computable? But to do that, you have to have a description language for all of those theorems. So about two, five years ago now, I, um, I really started pushing this uh, the International Congress of Mathematicians, which happens every four years, I, I was sort of pushing this in particularly, and I, I, you know, there was kind of the, can we can we organize the mathematics community to be behind something like this? And, and you know, it sort of was in the time when proof assistants were in the ascendant and so on. And it looked like that was kind of a, a moment when we could sort of say, let's systematize kind of pure mathematics. But I have to say, and it, you know, it kind of relates to what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, you know, my efforts to kind of organize the pure mathematics community to do this were not successful. I mean, I would say that it's one of these things where maybe if somebody's prepared to plop down enough money, um, it might be that the um, that people will sort of redirect themselves to um, to say, okay, we're going to build this sort of great artifact of our civilization, which is this sort of curated collection of the theorems of mathematics. But I think absent that, it's a... Um, uh, uh, you know, hurting mathematicians is is not really a doable thing, and and as far as I'm concerned, the um, uh, this project is is sort of too big and has no. I don't really see a kind of a um, a kind of um, uh, 
a sort of eco financial ecosystem around it that can justify you know it, it's really a piece of, of of pure intellectual philanthropy and i wish i could do it um, i mean we you know this is one of the one of the challenges one of the things in you know in my life it's like uh uh, you know, you can optimize what you do to make the maximum amount of money, or you can optimize what you do to be as interesting as possible. Um, you know, I try to make it as interesting as possible, and that requires, you know, having something where you have some raw material. You know, you can, you know, hire lots of people, you can make things happen, but it doesn't provide for the, in this case, uh, the scale of philanthropy that would be needed um, to curate three million theorems of mathematics, which is um, uh, quite quite substantial. Um, and I think it, it's kind of a, a um, uh, so so unfortunately it's it's uh, now in terms of pure mathematics we are we are continuing to work on that um, and we have been progressively working on some uh, uh, connections with things like the lean proof assistant system and um, the uh, uh, things like um, the um, uh, uh, we've been steadily building up. This kind of way of representing pure mathematics, but it's been a slow process. We've got a, a great team actually, but it's small, um, and I think it will be a long time before we, uh, you know, fully fully develop that. Okay, a question from Bob: Did I ever meet Stephen Hawking? Yeah, I absolutely did, uh, and I, I interacted with him a bunch when I was doing cosmology back in the early 1980s. Uh, not so much since then. I, I think um, uh, uh, he. Uh, he always used to make a, um, uh, he used Mathematica and um, we interacted with him a bit about that. Um, I think um, some of his later pronouncements about AI, I wasn't such a, I wasn't so impressed with. Um, but uh, 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 back in the day, it was um, when, when we were talking about cosmology, that was, that was interesting. Um, Question from Eric, you say the weather has a mind of its own. Is it conscious? Well, it depends what you mean by that word. You know, that's the, um, uh, uh, you know, this is always the challenge is, is, okay, you've got that word. So let's imagine that you say, you know, given that word, it has a consequence. So for example, we say, if it's conscious, it's got rights, for example, in the world. Okay, that's an interesting one. It's, um, you know, if, if, if this animal is conscious, it has certain rights. If it isn't conscious, if it's merely sort of operating on autopilot, it's just a tiny little bacterium and it's operating on autopilot and it's not conscious in some sense, then, yeah, we can give antibiotics and kill it type thing. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting in, the, in modern times with the, uh, the whole sort of world of, of uh, climate concerns and so on, this whole question about, you know, is the earth... A sort of a thing that has rights and so on. Uh, I think these are, you know, this question of does the weather have, my, you know, is the weather conscious? I really think you, you know, the meaning of that word has to be defined by what consequences it has. And I think that's a, you know, so it depends what you mean. And the answer is, if you're asking, um, does it have, you know, certain kinds of, could you attribute self-reflection of certain kinds to it? I'm sure the answer is yes. If you say, would we humans want to consider it to have rights? The answer is, hmm. You know, if we find out how to control uh, hurricanes, then I'm sure we're going to do it. And um, it's, uh, you know, and it's not, although sometimes with these global things, and that's obviously an issue with the, the whole climate thing and geoengineering and so on, it's a bit like the AI case. If we say, uh, I mean, if we had to say with AI, make it globally work this way, it's a big challenge to figure out how to do that within human society. You know, with geoengineering, if we say, okay, we're going to tip the, um, uh, you know, the balance of temperatures in the world or something to be this way, it's people like, oh my gosh, that means my farmland will be less valuable. Or that means, you know, in my particular corner of the world, this is going to happen. It's hard to do that. It's hard to make this kind of global decision about that. And, and you know, what we have to avoid with AI is being put in a position where we have to do kind of geo AI engineering because it's really hard. Um, okay, John K. What are your thoughts on uncomputable real numbers and their place in physics models? You know, I have a, a good friend, Greg Chaitin, who was responsible for uh, the idea of algorithmic information theory. This question about whether you know, whether true randomness exists in the universe, something like my rule 30 cellular automaton, it's got a tiny rule, but when you run it, it makes something which for practical purposes looks random. 
in Greg Chaitin's theory of randomness, things are only random if the very, very simplest description of the thing is about as complicated as the thing itself. And so the fact that Rule 30 has a simple description means in Greg's definition, it's not, quotes, truly random. It's not algorithmically random. So we've had a long debate about the universe. You know, is the universe like pi or like omega, which is his non-computable real number, which is the halting probability for a universal Turing machine, which is a number none of whose digits can be computed uh, necessarily. And um, it's something could be computed with a Turing machine. You can imagine a super powerful uh, thing that can compute them and so on, an Oracle Turing machine and so on that can compute them. But um, the, uh, you know, whereas pi is something which you can sit down with your Turing machine, you can just grind out digits. And so the question is, if we look at our universe, can we just like grind out digits and figure out what's gonna happen in the universe or is it fundamentally non-computable? Well, we don't know the answer. If we can find a fundamental theory of physics, we will know the answer, um, but we don't right now know the answer. My feeling is we don't yet have a reason to think that there's non-computability. So let's take as a working hypothesis that there isn't because we can get a lot further that way. Not least because we can kind of wrap our brains and our uh, you know, modes of thinking around that. I mean, the other thing that, is interesting, you know, back when, when Alan Turing was inventing Turing machines in 1936, and, you know, Alonzo Church was inventing lambda calculus at the same time, none of them thought that they'd figured out the universal theory of computation. There'd been previous ideas about primitive recursive functions, things like this, that didn't turn out to be universal. Gödel, when he invented what turned out to be equivalent with general recursive functions, he also didn't think he was inventing the general theory of what would be computable. But the surprising thing that kind of emerged in the decade or so after that was that all these different things that people thought were reasonable models of computation that had very different structure all turned out to be exactly equivalent. There was a very robust meaning to this idea of computation and all these different systems that people invented. Maybe they invented them because they're all humans and they all have brains that work in a certain way. I don't know. We don't know that yet. But they all turned out to be equivalent. And so that is what led to uh, you know, it slowly emerged, probably took until the 1980s before it was seriously emerging, and maybe even some of my own efforts were part of that. Um, this idea that there was sort of this robust notion of universal computation that could apply to everything in the universe. Now, you know, is it possible that something goes beyond that? Yeah, it's possible. You know, in the equations of general relativity, you can kind of, you know, they're, they're, it's easy to go beyond that. Even the wave equation can sort of go beyond that. But you know, is that a perfect description of the physical world? We don't know yet. Probably, I don't think it is, but we don't know that yet. The other thing that's sort of interesting is that whereas there's this been this condensation that happened around the idea of computation, around all these different models, you know, Turing machines, register machines, substitution systems, cellular automata, whatever else, they're all equivalent. But if you go above that, if you look at the next level of computational capability, like Turing machines that have oracles that say whether they'll halt, or real numbers that operate in this or that way, there has not emerged a robust set of those computational ideas. People say, well, I've got this model of, of sort of non-computable hypercomputation. Somebody else says, I've got this model, but it's not robust in the same way that, in the same way that, that ordinary computation wasn't robust pre-1930s, but it hasn't emerged. There hasn't been a robust thing that's emerged. I don't know whether that's significant, or whether that's just our you know, inability to think that way, but um, I think it's perhaps a data point. And as I say, my, my feeling is, let's make sure that we, you know, before we prove that it isn't computable, let's, um, uh, you know, before we go beyond sort of the, the Turing machine level, let's at least figure out whether we can do it that way. Okay, Bob is asking, could you one day feed your DNA into Mathematica and it reconstruct a face? Uh, yeah, well, so it could be used to solve crimes or reconstruct ancient hominids. Look, I, I think, you know, I, I got my genome sequenced back in 2010, and um, I uh, have it on my computer. It's, I look at it from time to time. When I see some, some medical discovery, I'll go check my genome and see whether, I'm, uh, see whether I have that. And occasionally, I've even done a, hey, I think I've got this weird thing going on, um, you know, and I actually go and model the protein. I've got one that I'm curious about right now, although I don't really care that much. Um, but um, it's, um, I think, um, uh, you know, my feeling is the genome is our program. 
It is hard to work out what that program implies. There's a certain degree of computational irreducibility to the whole thing. Will we be able to figure out what faces look like? You know, identical twins tend to have fairly similar faces. It means it's probably genetic. Um, uh, it, it's, um, uh, I think that the, um, I mean, it's, you know, some things like fingerprints aren't precisely genetic. Um, and, uh, you know, I think these things that involve folding in the embryo and so on aren't. But um, uh, I think that, um, you know, when people say, oh, you know, you can give your genome, it'll be, it'll be, you know, there'll be no, it'll, it's all privacy protected and so on. Uh, you know, realistically, it's going to be the case that you're going to be able to take um, genomes and predict features of faces and you'll probably be able to match those up. And I don't think that's going to be very long from now, actually. And, you know, it's a funny thing because the world, you know, these things happen and then the world gets used to it. And there are things where, you know, if you said from 100 years ago, oh, in, in the current world, everybody would know about this about people or everybody would expose this aspect of themselves or, you know, in some countries, everybody would publish the salaries of, you know, everybody in the country or whatever else. So there'd be, you know, cameras every street corner. People would say that's, you know, nobody will ever get used to that. But people do seem to get used to it. I. You know, I mean, maybe I'm, uh, as I am, and kind of an old codger, and I don't like some of those things, but, but it's still, somehow, society does manage to adapt. Another question from Bob about, what do I think about translating Egyptian hieroglyphs um, using Mathematica in the future? You know, I, I'm wondering about machine learning and its applicability to some of those kinds of things. I, I don't really know. You know, the one of those that I have been curious about is the... Um, uh, talk to the animals question, you know, to what extent can we use, you know, machine learning methods to understand, you know, what do the whale songs mean if they mean something, what, whatever it means that they mean something. I don't even know what it means to mean something, so to speak, in that case. Um, I think that um, uh, we've been, you know, talking about projects and things I've done and not done. I've, one of the, you know, one of the things I was actually going to collect at some point in the near future is projects that I have not done, projects that I thought about doing, but then I didn't do. And actually, there's one of those back from the early 1980s. I, I, for some reason, I was, I was, oh, partly I was trying to make some point, I suppose. I was, um, uh, it's like, come up with things that are patentable, but totally silly. And so one of the things I came up with, actually, a couple of things I came up with. One was an alarm clock that senses your sleep state, probably using EEG, and doesn't wake you up unless you're in the right sleep state. And of course, now those things exist. Um, so that was one of the, you know, a goofy idea that, that turned out to become real at some point. And the other one that I thought about that time was video games for pets. Well, then many, many years later, I was doing something with a ad agency, actually, that was interested in using our technology and so on. And I agreed to do some uh, sort of ideation session with them. And uh, so I was a bit frustrated. And I, again, not probably my best setting, but, you know, I was like, well, I've got this idea that I kind of had on the shelf for a long time. It's video games for pets. It's like, that's a good idea. That's a, you know, we could write ads for those. So, so we started looking at this. It was right around the time the iPad came out. And so I can tell you that the, the claws of a cat won't scratch an iPad screen, at least based on what I figured out at that time. And then I really wanted, my, my goal was to have a game that a cat could win against its owner. Because I was really curious, what would a cat, dog, whatever, uh, you know, what would it make if it was if it had the ability to make stuff, you know, Minecraft style or whatever? What would it make? Um, and a uh, uh, chap who was helping us at that project was like, the real species you should do this with is cockatoos. They're kept, you know, I, I actually mentioned this in an obituary I wrote for a friend of mine who owned a cockatoo, a rather troublesome cockatoo, actually, um, recently. And, um, uh, but, but, um, you know, making Twitter for cockatoos or something. But in any case, I, I think that this question about, um, you know, what would what would the creatures make, so to speak? Would we understand what they make? Would it be like archaeology from, you know, trying to understand an ancient civilization, trying to understand something? The the one several things went wrong with that project, and I decided not to do it. But one of my children was uh, pointed out the following thing to me. Sometimes people say, you know, in a in a uh, in a manner of speaking. You know, you're allergic to your customers. You don't like your customers. I, I, our customers are really nice. I, I, we, we have a great, uh, you know, the, the markets that we, uh, we serve and the customers we have are actually super interesting, which is, which is really nice. But, um, you know, this was a case where, 
it's like, well, I have a slight allergy to, you know, uh, pet dander and things like this. So, so my, my, my son pointed out that this is a case where you're not just metaphorically allergic to your customers, you're actually physically allergic to your customers. This is a really stupid project. So that was probably one of the one of the final nails in the not doing that project. But I do tend to believe that that with sort of modern machine learning methods, it should be possible to sort of you know decode, talk to the animals if we could figure out what to talk to them about, or if there's a common uh, you know form of meaning that we can we can exchange. And it's sort of a, a, t a test run for for anything we think about extraterrestrial intelligence or anything like that. Um, I don't know specifically about Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, thanks for the happy birthday wish there. Okay, I have um, um, a uh, um, John here. What is your favorite independent film that relates to your work? I don't know. Um, I'm not. Uh, there have been a number of, of films that have made use of kind of computation, you know, ideas that I've had. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we've been involved in a few, in a few movies that have um, sort of Hollywood style movies that have uh, made use of some things. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I have a great, um, great answer to that right now. Um, perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm forgetting something, but, um, Okay. Now, is that the last? Am I am I out of questions? Did I did I finish my um um? Oh, and it got really late. I see. This is what I this is what I get, and I'm 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 supposed to go off and do um. Uh, I'm surprised I haven't been being texted about um. Uh, maybe everybody forgot about my grand birthday celebrations or something. Um. The. Uh, uh, it's asking about applying NKS and machine learning. I actually did talk about that earlier. And yes, there's there's things to do there. All right, anything else? And then we should we should uh, wrap it up. And um, uh, well, this was fun for me at least. Hope hope it was fun for you guys. I was. Uh, it's different from what I usually do, and and um, uh, it's a good way to spend my birthday. Thanks for sharing my birthday with me. All right. Well, until the next time, I shall. I don't know, happy returns, I hope. Um, okay, bye-bye. <laughs>